Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, Season 2, Episode 20. This is actually the same number of episodes that we had for the entirety of Season 1, but we began that season a little bit later, so this time there'll be more episodes. I'm not sure exactly when the season will wrap up, but we've got more episodes go for sure. We've got people hanging out all over the place. we got people on Twitch, we got people on YouTube, and they are in from all over the world. We just did a big shout-out from where everybody was watching from. So a couple of quick announcements for today. First of all, a uh, brand new tutorial out on YouTube. This is open for everybody already. The it is a video about controlling making well, you know, controlling dominoes, but controlling dominoes by jumping to different angles. Hopefully it doesn't start. Oh, wait, I, I won't get ads now that I think about it because I pay for YouTube. So this is they'll travel up the wall and then we'll do some spirals. We actually translate them from one side to the other and do big helixes, and then we even go super crazy and start twisting them and wrapping them around and the and it's really kind of pushing the gravity individually so it's not a it's not like a fake we're kind of doing gravity pushing in all directions so it's pretty fun you should go check that out if you haven't already and uh the tutorial that's coming out next week is already available on the rocket lasso slack so if you're interested in seeing a tutorial about making ferrofluids on any object go and check out the rocket lasso Patreon. But in any case, we have got some Cinema 4D to do today, although I have to mention that we'll be doing a, a little break in the middle here where we're going to be watching the SpaceX and NASA live stream live because, uh, yeah, there's going to be a rocket blasting off and that's really fun. And I try not to miss those whenever I can, uh, whenever I can catch them, I'm going to try and do that. So that is the plan for today. Uh, but right now we've got questions coming in. So let's see what the chat has got for us. Um, I try to remember where I started last time. I don't remember. We got a lot of links coming in from Twitch and questions on Twitch. I'll start there today. Um, let me see if anybody's doubling down. Uh, here's another thing to mention. If anybody ever sees somebody click or put a link and you really like it, if you go like, oh, I really like that link, and you kind of reiterate and say, oh, like the link that's blah, blah, blah posted, then I'm more likely to go check that one out. So it's, a, you know, if more people are interested, then um then that's good um is it stream somebody's suddenly telling me that the youtube stream is dead stream here um i don't know that's not good if if it that died that sucks we're just getting going um if it dropped us a chat you know i'm gonna put a link there but um, I, of course I closed it's a lot. Oh, Rick is saying it's still going. Uh, well, somebody's saying it's still going fine on, on YouTube. So whoever's saying it's not working, you might want to go check it out again. Um, okay. Anyway, we're going to click a link. Um, let's see. Uh, MW's got a link. Let's see what he's got. Mute. Pull the audio down. Pull this over here. There we go. Now we're organized. Uh, a sinus. I'm not sure. A sinus two. Jennifer Townley. Uh, and this is from Jennifer Townley. What do we got here? Did they call out a specific effect? It's just a fun one. Uh, let's see what we've got. Kind of looks like a paper shredding machine type of effect right now. Is that, I'm not sure where it, we're ultimately going yet. Oh yeah, it is like a paper shredding machine. There's a really cool video of um, uh, Simone uh, who makes the shitty robots and she converted a, she took a 3D scan of her brain and turned it into slices and made a paper shredder out of it, which was pretty great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, is this a render or is it real? Concept and appearance, different wing parts. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but there's just a lot of in, there's just a lot of pieces moving. I mean, there you can see that there's some interconnections between some of these parts, and if they travel out far enough, then in theory that would work. But I don't. Oh, I guess that's how they can float. Yeah, they're getting floaters that way. But at a certain point, they're just kind of fake. Yeah, but if we're doing it 3D, then we could just do it kind of fake, right? So if we we here we are in cinema. And uh, we begin just with a cube. Make it, uh, I'm going to make it uh, 10 thick. So it's a very specific number that we can work from. Throw that into a cloner. Uh, I kind of, in this kind of situation, I do like leaving it as a grid because if we set this to say one, 
and we put the spacing of 10, or if we wanted a little space, you know, say 11 or 12, it's a grid, and this will actually pivot from the center point, and we can grow like that. So it's kind of like we're treating it like a linear. So we can make as many of those as we want running in a line. And the way ultimately that this works, is it is it two layers? No, it seems to only be on one. So is some of it static? Yeah, I guess the part... Oh, okay, so you get two things moving in two directions. And assuming that that is built for real, there has to be like two different points of rotation. So in this case, we'd probably want to double our spacing and say 24. We can make a duplicate and just offset that a little bit. I, I guess offset it exactly by 12. And now we have two different ones. So one set could spin one way and the other set could spin the other way. And actually that should be pretty straightforward. Let's just set that up to actually do that. I'll make a plane and this plane should control not the position, but the rotation. And which rotation do we want? Nope. And there we go, this one. So we can set this to whatever amount we want. I'm gonna say 90 degrees. And under fall off, something cool that we can do is create a time. By creating time, it's gonna be constantly increasing forever, I think. So if we hit play, it'll automatically just start spinning. Actually, currently it's set to a rate of 30, blending, shape, None. I mean, that seems. Hmm. Rate of 30. Well, that's not behaving the way I was expecting. Let me think for a moment. I thought that would just keep spinning forever. Yeah, we don't want that. We we want none. What when do we What am I blanking on here? There's not that many settings. It's just time. Turn off clamp, maybe? Oh, oh, well, there you go. It was as simple as clamp. I had this clamp turned on and that was stopping it. So now we're not clamped, and now this is going to spin 90 degrees every 30 frames. So that just sets a base speed for us. We could slow it down by changing how much rotation we are feeding it, or change it by changing the rate here. I could drop this down to 10. It's going to go three times faster. And essentially, it's saying, like, how long does it take to do that motion? So I'm saying it takes 60 frames to do that. So it's going to spin at 60 frames this direction. Uh, okay, cool. Fair enough. Now we can create our second one and feed in a plane. And I guess I could just do the same thing. We could just reverse it. Um, yeah, we'll just redo it again from scratch. It's pretty simple. 60 frames, not clamped. And it will also do rotation. Which rotation was it? 90, so we'll say negative 90. Excellent, uh, I'll move this one down because that one hangs out with this one. And there we go, we got two different pieces spinning and they're just going to keep spinning forever. Now, in theory, if this was built for real, you, you have your cylinder running through the center, you get this axis, something like this. And that, in theory, would be spinning along with one of them. But ultimately, you're going to need something that spins a counter direction, and then everything needs to be connected outside of the scope of that one. Now, currently, we're just feeding everything in identical shape, so we could you know, make you know, put a little bit of variation in here, pull these down so they get a little bit thinner, and we should be able to see them spin in a slightly different way. Um, I'm trying to think of the, any any particular specifics that would be really nice and cool looking here. We can. We're doing the spinning. We could change the various scales or rotations or the shape and have you know a shape morph from one to another. There's a lot of things we could blend between. Um, a lot of this is just kind of mechanical. I'm trying to think of what would be a neat uh, way to do it. One that's popping into my head. I don't know how good it will look, but it, we could create a most spline. Let's turn everything off for a moment. And this most spline, if we set it to the correct rotation and we start feeding it angles and bends and curves. Actually, we got to be really careful about the axis we do. We can only twist on one axis, but if we were to spin this 
And this is just the starting position. So let's find the correct one. Let's say 90. And we have our curve. And what's cool is you can actually do the curve over the course of the length. So we can actually get this kind of interesting spiral. We could spin this more. So you could start building a shape like this. T for scale, scale that up. And via using this spline, we could really change the way these curves look or use random effectors and change the way that that travels, overshoot things. Uh, a lot of options for that, but uh, just as a... Mm, I, I'm going to try and keep it relatively simple. We'll put a sweep, and then inside of that, I'll put a rectangle. Hold down Shift as I create the rectangle. It should make it a child. And there we go. Now that's being swept. If we give it a, a, the thickness is actually coming from the most blind, which can be good, can be bad. Typically, I like to control it independently, so I'm going to turn off Use Rail Scale. And now we're using this big rectangle. I can hit T for Scale and scale that down, spiral that really well. And now the width, I think, yeah, will be 12. Actually, no, it's 10. And the other one can be whatever we want. So we get something like that. Um, so we could make that thicker, and we just have to get the curvature right. How far should this be? spinning around and we don't have to worry too much about it we're just kind of arbitrarily making any shape that looks cool so that becomes one shape and we'll f i'm going to feed that into a cloner and make two of them turn it on and now we get a bunch of them but because we have two of them we can change one of them and currently it's going to like alternate so every other one that does a different look but i'm thinking let's take one and spin it i keep grabbing the wrong axis let's spin it the opposite direction Something a little bit like that. And then in the cloner, change this to not iterate, but to blend. And now, oh, do those not blend? I didn't think I changed any settings that wouldn't be able to blend, but that's not allowing a blend. Huh, well, that's disappointing. I thought that would just work. But it seems like Cinema's not acknowledging the most blinds as something that's blendable? That's a little surprising. Well, yeah. Well, okay. No, but look, I just... <sighs> weird. I just swapped... I just moved these... Um, I just moved the most blinds in, and it's acknowledging those. Weird. Uh, we still might be able to get around it if I feed it these most blinds, and it should transition from one to the other in kind of a weird way. It does seem like it's transitioning a little oddly. Yeah, why does it feel like we're getting like the, this is super random? What am I doing wrong here? Yeah, the, the plane effector is not doing anything. This cloner is the only thing turned on, and we're feeding it two splines. Uh, and for the most part, I'm, I guess I'll default these splines back to default. Maybe just do this curve. They're both the same now. Let's see if that's something. Yeah, okay. It was getting, well, at least that part of it was getting confused by a spline. You can't change, I just remember, you can't change point counts on splines. If we change both of them, it might be able to work. Anyway, the point being is now we have those two different shapes. And um, it they should still spin just fine. If we turn on this, those will still spin. Ignore those middle ones. Those are... Um, those aren't real. It seems to still show them. And then this entire thing, I think, could then be fed into the sweep. It seems to need to be put into a connect object. There we go. So we can sweep it like that. And there's a little bit curvature to those. Uh, there's several layers here that are just being a little bit, a uh, little bit of a pain. Um, it's fine on YouTube. It's un oh, it's unlisted. Um, that is actually good information. Thank you, Rick. Um, do 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 do. I gotta find the right window. Actually, this is Firefox, so this is what I need. Give me just a moment, everybody. The uh, I, I forgot to set the video as listed, so people can only find it directly through the link. Live, live. It is public. Done. Save. Hopefully, it doesn't kick people off, but that should make it public. Whoopsie. All right. <sighs> okay, so we're getting a little bit curvature to this, actually. <laughs> I would like if the sweeps would acknowledge. I'm going to try putting this back in sweep. I might have broken it because I had... Um, it was just because of the way I had structured it. So I'm going to try putting back in the sweeps and blending the sweeps, but there's a chance that those won't work. No, sadly, it does not work in the sweep, and I don't see any reason why 
nothing I'm doing is. So I guess I'll undo. We'll go back here. And we are getting all these nice individual shapes, but um, our rail spline is messed up. It doesn't know what direction to go. And it's going to be a lot harder to create a rail spline for a shape like this, even though, I mean, it's a cool look. But it's going to be really hard to make a rail spline. And I'm kind of stumped, actually, how to make a rail spline for this. I guess most splines might create their own rail spline. No. We can feed a rail spline within them. Man, hang on. This should be incredibly simple, and I'm super struggling with it for no particular reason. I mean, this is a this is a smaller part of the detail. I don't feel like we should worry about getting too stuck in this particular little one. We could just make that thinner and just kind of ignore the thickness that's coming through and let those do something like this. Um, but there is that there is a little bit of a twist in those, and I'm just going to acknowledge that. I'm going to acknowledge that we have this little bit of a twist. I'm going to acknowledge it and ignore it. All right, so let's say we've got that. And then uh, it's going to be quicker to make a duplicate of that hierarchy. And in this cloner, delete that plane and feed in the other one that we made. So now we should have two spirals doing their thing, but spiraling the opposite direction. Cool. Now, I mean, we can also grab the cloner and I can grab both of them potentially. Not a great idea. Actually, we can grab both of these. Can we change the initial rotation? That's the one we don't want to change. But if we change one of them, no, dang it. All right. Um, well, all I was going to say is if we create a, let's create a step in this case. So we got a step. Hey, I just noticed they changed the default spline finally in the step effector, which is great. You used to have this curve built in, which just, I know it was, that was weird, but now it doesn't. Um, so all I want to do is offset both of them. So if I got the right axis here, I'm not sure which one it is. There we go. Now we can offset them. So now you can see I'm spiraling them around a little bit. So it's the exact same layout, but each one is offset and the rotation a little bit. So it's just going to look more impressive in the way that they're spinning. So these should, except for that twisting that we accidentally have in it, like they shouldn't be hitting each other. We can visually avoid that if we just put a little more spacing between once again. Uh, I just need to think about how to put a rail spline in there. But for right now, I'm not going to worry about it. And we also copied it, so we need to offset one of them like that. So still not quite enough space in there. All right, we'll go a little overboard here, but I just don't want them intersecting. Man, the rail spline or the uh, thickness of this is really... Actually, I feel like we're changing, as I scoot them out, it seems to be changing the angle of the rail spline. That's why I'm chasing my tail on that. Uh, and, and this is just on me. This isn't, uh, we didn't like just bump into a bug or anything. This is just that. But now, now, now you can see that they are spaced out enough that they're not striking. Now, this all, this concept is still fine. And they can all be spinning on a cylinder, which is way too thin now because we made everything bigger. So these could all, in theory, be spinning on the cylinder, but only every other one. So it's like some of these would have to be welded on the outside, and the rest of them need to be freely uh, freely moving, which is actually a pretty weird and interesting detail. Um, I think each of them would need, if you're building this for real, one entire set of these needs, like this, uh, how, how can we distinguish here? I'm going to make a material, colorize it. And put it on there. So we got our red one. The red one could be welded directly to this pipe. Oh, yeah, those are those are fused. But the other one's spinning a different direction. Obviously, those couldn't be connected in the same way. So my thought, if you're building this for real, what you'd have to do is have them welded, or they have to be kind of looping on a ring. So my thought is create another cloner. Keep this really clean, um, just for us to be able to visually see it. I'm going to use a torus shape. And yeah, line these up T for scale and pull these down. So if you think of these as sort of a ring that these could be all strung around, get the radius proper. Oop, I'm doing it backwards. This one, something like that. So imagine, let's make another layer here. Maybe a lighter orange color and apply that to this and this. Each of those are sort of independent. They're just hanging out on the tube, but they're not stuck to it. And now the reality of it would have to be that this would be spinning, like let's, this one could be being driven by a separate motor on the outside. And that separate motor 
would singularly drive this one. But then you can see in the actual artwork that we're seeing here, if this is made real, and my assumption here is it is real, because if it was real, you wouldn't put those connections in between. Um, let's see, I'm going to need to make the red ones not quite as long, just so it, it, we, they never need, they, they can't pass through each other. So I need to make the red ones shorter. It should be easy. There we go. Just make those shorter. So um, I'm not sure what the absolute best way to do this would be. Yeah, it's going to actually be kind of tricky because I need a little cylinder that goes from one to the next to the next to the next to the next to the next. Um, and we did all this offsets and the spacing isn't necessarily the same. And the connections need to be outside of where the red ones are. Um, and that's if you're building that for real. Now, obviously, we're not building it for real. We're building it in 3D and we can do whatever the heck we want. then yeah how would i i'm just trying to think how i how would i connect those now this connect this um that connector yeah maybe maybe this this cloner could be cloned onto i'm not sure so just for fun make it make a cylinder put it into the cloner and i'm going to clone onto an object and the object is going to be that connect object which is holding our yellow sequ you know, sequence here. Now, yeah, it is acknowledging it as a, as a spline, which is good. Um, yeah, so Jamie and everybody, sorry, I, I didn't set the show to public on YouTube, so it didn't show up right away. So that's on me. Sorry. Um, Let's see. Now, this is saying, okay, we got this cloner, and it's cloning onto an object, and it's got a count of 10, but I don't see it anywhere. Set it to step. Still don't see it anywhere. Hmm. Maybe... <sighs> Doesn't seem to like that as a source to clone onto. Well, there, there's a bunch of them. Is it acknowledging it as a spline? Oh, actually, it is. Okay, it's acknowledging that, so that's actually good. This is per step, but if we set it to count, and I say per segment, and we set it to one, then this should be creating one cylinder per count. And if I offset them, oh yeah, look at this. This is working better than I thought it would. So this is now creating... I'm cloning onto this cloner, which is, you know, has a whole bunch of splines that are transitioning in between two states. And now I'm saying I want to create a count of one per segment, and I can offset them per segment to a new position. So I'm going to these mostly outer, maybe not all the way in, and this might not perfectly line up on each one. In fact, we can already see guaranteed it's not going to. And we didn't make these very thick. So once again, we're not, we're not doing a great job of getting that base geometry because now that we're building these cylinders, we need to see the thickness of them actually connecting, even though this is doing a really great job of cloning them properly. And you can see each one there. And, you know, we have the ability to offset them like that. So even though I'll be able to visually maybe make it work on some of them, each one is a little bit independent of the next one. Um, and these don't perfectly overlap as the transition happens. So that would work a lot better if these were thicker, which they're not. And if we make it thicker, then we're going to start getting really bad overlapping problems. So I was hoping we could just ignore that problem. And it just keeps coming back to bite us. How do I get this rail spine to work? I mean, we can... It's just the direction, but it needs to be perfect. <sighs> It needs to be really perfect. If we were to create a second connect, that becomes the rail spline. And that rail spline needs to be modified slightly, but in a way, oh, well, that seemed to have worked shockingly well, actually. I put in, I made a copy of the entire connect and just shrank the angle a little bit, which seems to have given them all a distinct direction, but it's entirely possible that one of these somewhere is suddenly popping in a orientation doesn't want to. Now, the spirals and the scales and everything that we're feeding through could be super duper relevant, but let's just go on the continued assumption that that's working. 
we've got these cylinders that should be connecting everything. So let's just get these offsets proper. Maybe something like that. Does this seem to work all the way through? Oh, okay, not it doesn't work everywhere. So we're going to have to maybe keep it right on the line. And I, yeah, even up here, these just aren't thick enough to catch up to the other ones. It has to be outside the range. So it, we just would, you know, have, have to keep making this thing thicker and thicker. And then, you know, at a certain point, it will get thick enough where they can, they will run into each other. And you can now see that those will all be connected. Anyway, that's a long winded way of saying mechanically that this connection could be drive, being driven by one motor and then this axle could be spinning the other way. And so you could end up with these two motions where these two things are never touching each other but are completely, you know, intertwined in lots of crazy ways. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's more of a mechanical limitation. In, in 3D, we don't really have to worry about that as something, so probably shouldn't have spent quite as much time on it as we did, but yeah, I want to see if we could sort of do it. Save the scene file. Um, I don't even know what to call this. Um, an alternating spin. Good enough. All right, back to the chats. Let's see. Let's see what we've got. Uh, I'm going to jump to YouTube and see if anybody is chatting there with a question. I know I know that more, there's going to be less people there. So feel free to post a question on YouTube. If anybody is hanging out on YouTube, just put a big capital question at the beginning so it jumps out to me. But for now... Um, there are still lots of Twitch questions. Hmm. Meeks has got a question about procedural lines and a tree trunk illustration. Int I'm intrigued. I don't have uh, a good intuition for where this is going, but... Oh, hmm. Um, let's see. Procedural lines in a tree trunk illustration. I mean, oh, wait, there's probably more down here. Oh, I saw these renders. These are gorgeous. Who made these? First of all, we got to give credit if we're going to do anything along these lines. Multiple owners. Lots of people made it. Actually, it's Chris, Chris Gayot and Toast, both from Puerto Rico. Uh, very nice. I'm actually a quarter Puerto Rican. I don't look it, but my grandmother's from Puerto Rico. Do, 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 do. Oh, did you call a specific one? Because, you know, your link just went to all of them. So I'm assuming you mean this one. Yeah, I'm assuming you mean that one. That's... Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, there's there's some here. Yeah, I saw some of these renders, and but these are gorgeous. I love the colors. I'm assuming you mean this one, because that's the one that would be sort of challenging. Um, Let me think uh one thought pops into my head but it's not super procedural it's definitely not super procedural that'd be kind of tricky but it's relatively simple. I mean, there is the level where it's like, okay, just model, just model it, and then paint. Like you use a sculpting tool and just paint those out, or you use body paint and paint some lines in there, and then boom, you'd be able to make those be whatever. So you could just hand illustrate this, and you can even see that there's a little, there's some variation. Like you see how close it can get over here. So I think these were hand drawn. So I'll throw that there. Somebody unwrapped the UVs here and hand drew these on there, which would you know, it'd be pretty quick, pretty zen. Uh, just as a quick illustration of that, I shall model up something quickly. I guess uh, I can't think of anything that this would be appropriate on except for sort of a plant tree trunk type of situation. So we'll stay on theme there. So we'll just do a couple extrudes there and maybe sort of branch here. Eh, let's do a loop. This is not going to be a great model here. Oh, don't preserve the groups. Something like that. So there we go. That's our wonderful tree trunk model. Throw that into a subdivision surface and make that editable. And then go into the sculpting tools. Usually you can just go into sculpt as the layout. Wink. And we can subdivide it a few times. Um, subdivide. I think 
I might be doing this wrong. Base mesh. I, I don't do sculpting often, so I don't know if I've been decreasing polygon pull levels subdivide. Is it subdivided? I don't know. And uh, the pull tool doesn't seem to be doing much. Okay, it is subdivided, but come on. Pull tool, smaller, length, spacing, build up. Am I on the wrong object? Probably on the wrong object. No, that's right. Sculpting tag, do I have to be on the sculpting tag? Hmm. Uh, I do sculpting so infrequently. I'm <sighs> clicking the wrong button. Clicking the wrong button. Because this is not acknowledging it as it should be. And I doubt we have to be on polygon mode. Select all. I mean, you can sculpt on polygon mode. <sighs> well, I this was the... Dang it. Come on. What am I doing? Oh, I turned on lock. That might have been a problem. Oh, I turned on lock thinking I was like turning on activate, but I turned on lock. That's my fault. Uh, if I hold down control as I draw, you can see I get these individual lines and we didn't have to do any UV unwrapping. And if we just have this subdivided enough, we can make this smaller. Just right click your middle mouse button and we can say sculpt the line, sculpt the line, sculpt the line. So I want to throw out there that this is the way I think that they did it. It's pretty clean. It's pretty straightforward. You'd be nice and artistic with it and make whatever the heck you want. So that's what, it, what I think they did. Having said that, the question was, can we make, you know, can we kind of automate that a little bit or uh, make it procedural? Now, I don't think we can make it procedural, but we might be able to build a rig that kind of does some similar things. Um, I guess it'd probably be good actually to work from that same mesh. If I delete that, yeah, we go back to the original mesh. Nice. So I'm gonna copy that, open a new one. I don't, I don't think we need to save that file. I'm gonna delete the original mesh, and so this is gonna be our mesh. We'll still work from the same one. I have no idea how well this is gonna work, but here is the theory. I'm gonna turn this into a rigid body, and we're gonna clone a bunch of splines around it. So I'm not even sure what the best spline would be. Probably a helix. Helix is just a good one to start out with zero radius zero end radius lots of end angle or no end angle rather and we don't need too much height actually this overall model is pretty big so i guess i can leave it here but we don't need as many points i'm gonna set it down to 10 so there's 10 points involved in that um create a cloner put that into the cloner clone a bunch of these onto the surface i we could say clone onto every point we can also say clone onto every point, but you just let's just do the surface and make as many of them as we want to. Uh, I want to make sure that these are oriented in such a way that they are away from the mesh a little bit. So we can change the initial rotation to something, let's say like 180. These will kind of be spiking out. That's not really giving us any, it's not making it easier because they're so far away from the surface. So I think 90 degrees would probably work pretty well, although some of them are still sneaking inside the surface. So you know what, actually 180 is probably a good idea. We'll flip them around. They're all sticking out like needles or like their hairs. And we need a, we're going to need a bunch of them. I don't want to go overboard, and there's going to be a limit to how many we can have, but let's crank it up to 100 just to start out with. Um, and that is already a rigid body. What we need is these to be soft bodies. So simulation, soft body. I don't know if we need to make it edible. I don't think we do. So... Um, even though there's a lot of them, I hope this won't take too long to calculate. So I'm going to save this. Actually, this, some of this might work pretty well. I don't know. Let's save the scene file. To a stump lines. And I'm just going to hit one frame forward. We're doing some dynamics. So we're not sure how that'll go. Uh, actually, you can see there's a lot more. It looks like a lot more than one subdivision on there. That's probably the helix. You can see it's got intermediate points. I can set that to none. And now let's go frame forward. And now you can see it's a lot better. So there we go. That's working well. Uh, this is a rigid body. I should have made that a collider body. So let's say dynamic off. And now 
those should fall away, but the stump stump will remain. Boom. Okay. Those fly away from the surface. We could on our cloner give a little bit of space to them, offset these on Z, so they're not quite touching. And that they should maybe explode away a little less. Although they're oh, 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 we gotta change the sub this mesh to be not automatic, but a static mesh. Because it must be seeing yeah, it's seeing this shape as a what do you call it? A convex hull. There. Now those should not fly through it. All right. Nice. Working well so far. Turn off gravity. Control D. Dynamics. Gravity. None. Now we want these to be attracted to the surface. Uh, in the past, that might have been kind of difficult. And I hope this doesn't take too long to calculate. But should be pretty straightforward. And if you watch the dynamics or the new domino tutorial that I just released, then you'll see a similar technique in that. We should be able to use forces, the field forces. And this is going to be pulling everything. If we set to 40, it'll behave exactly like gravity. And the force, the direction we want, should be based off of the surface of the object. So we drag that in. And if we preview this via the field force, everything's a little bit big in this scene. It's bigger than I thought it was. But I want to see a nice cross section. So I'll set this up to x of 1000 and z x y of 1000 zero so we should get a cross section crank this up and we can see from the surface we're getting a little some of the lines right there obviously we want these to go further out so on this here's the radius i'm gonna crank that way up in fact we could crank it you know it can go pretty much to infinity and those will go out it just cares about the individual points of the spine we're feeding but this should be either pulling everything towards the surface or away from the surface. Now, there's going to be currently a fall off where they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker as they go. So inside of this, under remapping, I could say full power. And you can see how the power gets strong all the way through. And the radius is a limiting thing. It might take longer to calculate. I'm not sure. But I do want this to be big enough that we're catching all of our splines. It's hard to tell because our grid stops. But I think that should be enough to catch all of them. Now, we don't actually need to preview this. So I'm going to say don't display that. And I'm going to carefully go frame, frame, make sure everything's not going nuts. And you see, everything's pushing away from the object. So it's backwards. But do you, do you see how each of the needles is kind of flying away from it in the direction that the needle was facing? So that's a encouraging start right there. Ooh, look. Uh, sorry, we're going to be jumping to the SpaceX. But look, the uh, we're going to watch the launch. Right? Maybe they're, they're moving the arm away. Nice. So yep. now if something goes wrong on the pad, they would have to... Uh, the, the top of the rocket would eject away. So we're going to watch the launch of that later. Uh, okay, the field force. Back to the direction. Currently, the direction is set to invert. It always defaults to that where it kind of pushes things away. Turn off invert, and that should be pulling it towards it. So this should just be pulling everything towards the surface. And if we give it a moment, I think all of them should flop pretty well to the surface. Actually, yeah, that's working pretty well. A um, couple things we can see. These are too stiff right now, so they're not conforming to the overall surface. Pretty straightforward to fix that. Inside of the helix, we have all the controls here. Shear and flexion are going to be the bend, primarily flexion. Dropping that down to five, I think we'll immediately see these bend quite a bit. Yeah, they're a lot, you know, they can just bend over a lot more. So, you know, working quite nicely. Might need a few more frames. I'll jump that way up. And now we want these to have a certain spacing between them. And that should be easily achievable which is just one of my favorite things when it comes to using these soft bodies, is we can set a, I think we have to use a margin. So I'm going to turn a margin and we'll start with a margin of five. I'm not sure. Well, we can visualize this actually. It's smart to do that. If we throw this cloner with the helix inside of a sweep and we sweep it with an end side, um, it's only going to do one. That's fine. That's all we need to see. This is if, as I scale this radius, that is sort of the radius that we can expect to end up with, whatever I set this to. But we have two variables we have to keep in mind. And one of them is the spacing of it. So actually, I didn't, I've never thought of it in this way. But if we throw this end side on there and we set this to probably four sides would visually be the best. This is the radius, but you can see the subdivisions of the points that we're currently feeding it. And if this is really rectangular on the long side, then that means we've made it too big. It can't handle that radius with the current point count. So if I start scaling this down to around there where they become more square, that's a, be that's a better radius that should be able to work. Um, so I'm not sure how well that 
theory travels through, but currently that's saying a radius of 14. We either, either that should be a pretty good number or it's double what we want. Turning off the sweep and the inside, going inside the helix dynamics tag, we can set this margin to 14. I'll just round this down to 14 and carefully hit one frame forward. If everything it kind of explodes, it's too high. Um, well, it doesn't really feel like it's exploding. It might be a little, yeah, it's a little too high. So we can try cutting in half, but I'm going to drop it down to 10. That should be pretty good still. Yeah, 10 is good enough. Now, these all have their own little radius of 10, which means they cannot bump into themselves and they can't bump into another spline if it has a radius, if it's within that radius of 10. So you see right here, these are staying away from each other a little bit. And if we, it's, you can still see they can land on top of each other. I'm not sure to what degree that those can maybe sort themselves out. But in a lot of these areas, it's actually doing a pretty nice job of conforming to the shape and not overlapping each other. So you, you see them actually laying out pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. So... Um, somebody's talking about emitting particles. Um, that wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to make them avoid each other very properly. Or it's, 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 it would be more complicated of a rig than what we're currently doing. Um, so that's working well. I do want to maybe even make them more bendy. So I'm going to lower that. Um, they should be able to maybe bend and conform a little bit more there. I'm trying to think of any way. I mean, we can make these splines force each other to you know, avoid each, yeah, we can make them avoid each other. That could be a good idea. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, these pushing up and down actually wouldn't affect the final look. Um, one, I'm trying to think if there's a problem with it because you see they're pretty far from the surface now, which is a problem. So how would I go about maybe fixing that? One thought would be, what if the dynamic surface was deflated a little bit? So this would actually be the surface that we want. So I want to display it differently. Um, render tags, display, use lines. So that's going to be the original surface. But if we take this one and deflate it, and I can do that several ways, one of which is to use a displacer. And inside the displacer, feed it a solid color. And I can see it inflates out. So, you know, that's kind of cool. But we actually want it to do almost exactly the opposite. Actually, it's a good way to do this is if I inflate this out, you see that that's about right where they're touching. So we actually want to do negative 11. So it shrinks it by that equivalent. Now, that's actually what's dynamic, which should enable all of those to fall to the smaller surface. And with the smaller surface that they're trying to hang out on, then that you should hopefully be able to see that they're now almost perfectly lining up on what is our actual geometry. So yeah, there's that. Now we've got a bunch of lines happening there. Um, if we actually want to maybe see this in real time, I it may or may not work. Uh, but if we make this one the actual one that we're seeing, could I heavily subdivide it? And we can maybe see this in real time. I'm not sure. Three by three. That's decent subdivisions. And then uh, I'm going to try using a plane. I've been using planes a lot as our my deformer of choice. I can make this a child of subdivision surface, but not the model. That way it's actually seeing the subdivided geometry. And this is going to be a deformer, deforming the points. And it doesn't push out on Y. It pushes on Z. Let's say negative five on Z. And you see it shrinks a little bit everywhere. So if we limit this in the fall off to where this is, then hopefully that would only calculate from that. So if I bring this in as a spline object, okay, yeah, not bad. Bring this in as a spline object. You can now see that we've got some shapes around the outside, which does seem to be refreshing properly. Um, Let's make sure that, oh, yeah, currently it's set to curve and along, but I want that actually to be a radius. There we go. I was like, well, that's not quite visually looking the way I expected. Okay, by setting this to radius, I can now change this radius. And we would want it, you know, depending on how subdivided it is and what the radius is, then we want that to be pretty, you know, do that pretty carefully. But that just worked kind of out of the box. I'm a little, I'm surprised it worked so well out of the box. And there, look at that. 
we've now got these lines on there. And if we play, how well, yeah, it's still updating. So like actually you could sort of animate that. That's kind of cool. Um, okay, uh, I'm actually quite pleased with the way that's working. So um, yeah, a lot of, um, yeah, Paul's saying we can invert it. Yes, of course we could. We can go into this and say, this plane should not be going negative. It should go positive. So turn that on and I'll push these out. So you, and you can end up with that effect. We can remap them in any way we want. Currently we are doing this radius so we can make the lines fatter. We can make them thinner. Actually, look at how cool that looks. Increase that. And now you're getting these really nice stylized lines traveling around. That's pretty cool. Uh, now, you know, as we were just seeing, this is actually working in real time. So if I have play, well, not real time, but it, it's it's wor it's refreshing properly. So I know we've been bumping into some limitations in the dynamics and or not dynamics, yeah, uh, I guess in dynamics and cloners and whatnot. But you can now see that we can actually have play and it's doing it's getting us some playback. We're actually getting some nice some nice wrinkles and animation on there. Now I'm gonna make them thinner just because it's clearer what's happening. And let's see what potentially could we, you know, how could we potentially push this a little bit further or make it do more? These shorter lines, I think, are we don't want them to be too long. If they're too long, then it might they're going to overlap each other more, but them overlapping is not necessarily a really bad thing. And then um, we could create more clones. Currently, we're just arbitrarily throwing that amount on. Uh, let's see. What are some things we could do? Let's unhide our cloner. I'm going to make a duplicate. Let's set this down to five subdivisions and half the length. So we're going to get some shorter ones. And eh, why not? Let's make some longer ones. So I'll copy one in and we'll make double the points double the length so we've got a mix of all of them it's running it's running reasonably well but i will double the count so we've got a lot more clones around we do seem to have more in certain areas than others but that's fine um temporarily well it's um if i turn off our subdivision surface then i i think that might be taking a lot of calculation time for us so if we just let this run and get them into their final position a little bit more than that might, you know, it's going to play back quicker. It's the point there. So we can let all these fall. Now, because that gravity is doing such a great job of pulling everything right to the surface, um, and honestly, we could probably even displace it down a little bit more so they're going to intersect or they'll be able to get even closer to the surface. Um, this is all just being directed or directly attracted to the surface, but I'm pretty sure if we go really low on the friction on all these splines, so no friction, they should be kind of free to slide around more. And then on top of that, we can make a little bit of turbulence. Now we could do that directly in the field force. I'm going to do it as a separate object just because it's, you know, it's just clean to keep them separate here. So creating a little bit of turbulence, give it a little bit of scale. And that should just be pushing randomly in all directions. And you see the strength of it's quite weak. So this is just adding in that little bit of randomness. So the idea would hopefully be that everything's going to be mostly attracted to the surface as if it's the ground, as, as if it's a planet or gravity. And that turbulence will keep it alive and all these lines will keep on traveling around the entire thing. And especially if one slides off the other one, the radius should keep it from wanting to cl ever climb up on top of the other one. So let's just, uh, you know, these have all fallen to the surface fairly well. We can turn this on and see what the end result line looks like. And yeah, look at these nice little lines that we get. Hit play. It's kind of just, <laughs> just kind of looking wrinkly there. So once again, stylistically change lots of things, increase this. And there's even like we can change. Here's the radius fall off. So keep in mind that we could create uh, a varied radius where it can actually fall in and fade in, fade out. If our poly count was even higher here, this is, I don't want to hit play. But if we set this 4-4, four, four, we have even higher poly count and you can get these lines traveling in. And the the radius and the the you know controlling this curve and how those combine. There's a lot of power there. Um, but yeah, I think keeping that up to full and it gets kind of like a cool stylized. Yeah, it's very kind of the extra poly counts are making that a little bit uh, more stylized looking. Try extruding this a little bit more. Ooh, that's neat. Uh, we're seeing this internal mesh a little bit behind that. I mean, it's kind of like a, a stylized tree bark or maybe some really wrinkled skin. Um, 
And, you know, the fact that it's just kind of attracted to the surface. Actually, look at these pits. That's pretty cool, too. Are we still super subdivided? Oh, I mean, I'm impressed. Look how well this is running with that many clones. And this is subdivided four times. This is a lot of polygons. Pause. Yeah, there's a lot of polygons in there that we're calculating frame by frame. Yeah, that's actually working a lot better than I thought it would. Um, I mean, just, yeah, just that this could be an animation. I mean, it's not, it's very kind of organic looking. We should have gone a little bit further into making it maybe a tree shape. But getting these living lines on the surface, like that's maybe where the real power of this is. So just for fun, actually, how well is the turbulence pushing everything along? That's sort of a question here at play. And is the turbulence keeping this alive pretty well? I mean, there's still a lot of movement, so I'm going to say yes, frame by frame. Keep in mind, everything's going to be you know, a lot quicker in real time. Actually, um, oh yeah, this, well, this is the surface that we're seeing. Why does it seem like those are so far away? Oh, no, some are. Oh, oh, these are climbing over that one. So some lines are right on the surface. Okay, so it's just we have a lot of lines. I just want to make sure that that was properly layering up. So assuming that that is all layered up and working fine. Um, let's just render this out. Um, let's make a... Mm, I mean, I just want to render quickly. I was going to put a copper material on there, but then we have to turn on some physical render, and that's going to take a lot longer. I guess it looks good in the viewport, though. Viewport renders don't let you play back too much, though. So whatever, I'm overthinking it. Let's just send it to the picture viewer with all frames. Boom. And let's see. We can even. What's cool is um, all this original geometry is still identical. So if we were inclined, you know, this model is still very. Oh, I didn't. Oh. Well, this this I did make this editable, so the uh, I thought we were still on the super duper low poly version, and we're not. But this geometry could be updated, and both models could be updated with it. I just want to see how these move around on the surface because that's fairly unique and interesting. Uh, yep, T minus thirty, everybody, for the SpaceX launch, or the NASA launch, but from SpaceX. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're letting that run. I'm gonna check the chat a little bit. Oh yeah, Zach, I wasn't even thinking about it, but um, if we have these extruded properly, we could even render out the splines. So the splines become these little noodles traveling on the surface. Uh, that's probably gonna require putting this into a connect, and then that can go into the sweep, sweep those. And yeah, it's going to look weird, but give that a couple extra sides, shrink it a little bit, maybe. And yeah, those will fairly perfectly match the, uh, the layout on those. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. The, turb uh, the turbulence is maybe a little weak. A, a lot of that movement just seemed to be at settling. You see it's still kind of alive in the way that they're moving. Yeah, that that is working better and easier than I thought it would. It's kind of applying some techniques we've talked about in the past. And... Um, you know, just kind of putting a new spin on it. So make this uh, that. Maybe make a green and orange type of thing. Send this back out again. Just see what those little noodles will do. Um. <sighs> <laughs> hey, Gillies, um, how do you use field forces in metal like medical animation? I'm not sure if that's an intentional joke question. It feels like a joke question because, you know, that's like saying, 
how do you model or how do you actually how do you model would be more sensical <laughs> um where did i get that question from uh that was from twitch so let's jump over to youtube hey till from berlin um somebody's asking about triplanar i'm not an expert in triplanar so sorry that's not a great one for me to attempt to tackle actually that was kind of the only question up on youtube right now there's a bunch on twitch um yeah and somebody's asking a corona materials question i've never i've only spent like 20 minutes in corona renderer so can't really help there Yeah, sorry. A bunch of people have some oh, U D U D I M or U D I M uh, support in the new UV systems. Uh, sorry, not something I'm super familiar with. Uh, oh, actually, Rick replied to there, so no U D M S yet or U D M S. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um. Anyway, uh, let's go to an official type question. Um. um uh, how would you tackle a simple palm frond waving in the wind? Uh, the, I, I like the idea of these noodles on top, but it's just kind of killing it. Like we can't see through them, so I'd probably have to make them a lot smaller. So we'll do that. Actually, I'll we'll make them real tiny. Visually, real tiny. Let me let that go for a few frames. Uh, a palm frond. Um, let's Google. Let's do a Google image search of a palm frond and go to images and just see what we're kind of dealing with here. So yeah, so your standard kind of uh, palm tree leaf. Um, I mean, it depends on what your application of it's going to be. If you were making a ton of them, I'd probably want it to be like a very singular, simple piece of geometry. Wow, that looks very organic and gross. Now you get these little worms writhing around on it. I like the idea of the worms. It does fight the effect because it calls so much attention to itself. I don't know. That's neat, though. I, I feel like there's some additional future applications of this idea. And we'll have to think about that more in the future. <sighs> um, so well, let's let's look at the palm fronds. We got 24 minutes until launch, so we got a little bit of time. And we'll do another question too afterward if we're feeling like it. Um, okay. So anyway, once again, when it comes to that type of question of like, oh, we're trying to essentially model a leaf, how you know how would you animate it? Well, it depends on what your end result is. Because we could make a cloth version of it. We could make a soft body version of it. We could make a a regular IK setup of it. If there's something you're keyframing, you would do it differently than if you want it to be running with dynamics. If you want it to be interacting with other objects, if you want to interact with other leaves of itself. There are a lot of variables here. I mean, one... What's a good way of doing this? Actually, if we find a good image here... Like some of these are like just product images and I don't want to, let's see if we can search uh, tools, usage, modification. Let's see if we get anything. Are any of these sort of usable? They're all very bent. Oh, there we go. So this one's labeled for reuse with, uh, at least Google saying it's labeled for reuse. So I'm gonna copy that image, go into Photoshop, paste the image. Excellent. Um, two things we need to do. Um, let's rotate it. We need to level this out a little bit. Pretty much straight up and down, and I'm gonna eyeball it, but pretty much right in the center. Everything else is working all right there. Um, and then duplicate the layer and create a mask. Now I'm not. This is not going to be a perfect mask by any means, but I'm just going to do a big magic wand selection and invert control shift I is the invert shortcut and create a mask from that. And you can see we now have this mask. I could select all and copy it. If we want to steal that mask, paste it into a new layer, there's different ways to do that. But now we have that mask layer. And then if you were super inclined, if this mask wasn't going to be perfect, you can always take 
this leaf and extend it out, blur it. So let's see, if I were to create another layer, I'm gonna blend this one down. And so it kind of baked it, duplicate that layer. And on this one, do something like blur it a little bit. Gaussian blur. So that will blur out that layer and we don't have to go too far. So we'll just blur, blur out that layer. So we have this one underneath. And if I keep on duplicating that layer, it's gonna layer up on top of itself a bunch of times. You see, I've actually kind of inflated the overall leaf. And now if we put the original one, now it has something it can bleed into. If we extend past it, we probably want to blur the edges a little bit. That's fine. I'm not super worried about this. Uh, we'll just save two images. And uh, I guess you can save it as a Photoshop document, so why not? Um, I don't think we need to keep it complicated. Or we can even just save it as a PNG. But let's save it as a Photoshop document. Episode 20 scene files. Uh, you get these scene files if you're supporting on Patreon. Just something to throw out there. Palm frond. Save. Back into Cinema 4D. Nice. Um, so we need to make this material relatively straightforward. In, actually, first we need to save the scene file so we can find the material. Otherwise, it's going to be like, do you want to copy the material over? It's like, no. No, I don't. Um, in the color channel, we shall go into the scene files, texture, grab our palm frond, go inside there, and we can select the layer. It'll open this up, and there's our different layers. Did I uh, show layer content, please? There we go. There, background. I want the background there. And inside the alpha, there's different ways. Like I said, there's a dozen different ways we could approach this, but let's load this in here as well. Select the layer, and I just want that layer. So that becomes the alpha. So now we should have an alpha to out leaf. I don't have the ratio, but you, boom, you can see we have a leaf. So that's a basic, basic bit to get the the uh, frond in there. So, um, like, oh, what's what are some super duper basics? Well, you know, let's create a sphere. And set it to icosohedron. And yeah, that's actually fine. So the first thought is what if we make hair? I'm gonna add hair. And then we got all these hairs. I'm gonna make it twice as long. Under dynamics, under advanced, I'm gonna say I want a custom number of guides, set that to three. And now if we have play, they should bend over nicely. Let's uh, set to four. That seems like a nice amount where it can settle down a little bit. So that looks neat. Under generate, I don't want to render hairs. I want to create a, we could do sweep, but I'm going to create a flat. And now you're going to see all these crazy ones, but actually don't, uh, currently the hairs are all generating. I'd want the hairs to generate as guides. So now we have exactly that count. Under the hair, we can set the thickness overall, which is going to be a lot. I'm going to jump up to 50 perhaps. Nope, even 50 is not enough. Uh, 100. Now, actually the orientation here is quite random and not, uh, I was hoping they'd level out a little bit. We can, there might be a way of doing that. Currently the alignment is set to free. We set to look there, set to look on Y and now those should be pretty even, pretty uniform. And now that that is just geometry, if I drag on our leaf material, then now I've got a bunch of hair-based palm fronds and I, you know, this is all live. I can move this around, let them wiggle. They're going to interact in a way that hair reacts. And I mean, it's a great quick setup to create these as we want to there. It, we have the option of creating some variation inside the hair material. These could be different scales, just turn on scale and add on some variation in scale. And now we can get, get bigger ones and smaller ones. Uh, the sphere could be smaller and we just let that eat up that. So that works pretty well. Um, the angle, the frizz, we have a lot of ways of creating additional randomness and uh, control. I mean, uh, just as a for instance, give ourselves a couple extra frames, hit play, and under simulate, the, the simple one, just create some turbulence and give it a little bit of scale, jump out to 55, and now these should be blowing around in the wind pretty well, a little strong in the wind, but... Now these should stay alive and wiggle with the wind. There's still hairs, so it's not gonna be perfectly on the leaf, but if we create another object as a collider, 
think we have to make it editable. I'm not sure, but uh, add a hair collider. I should hopefully be able to go through. Yeah, we actually, you know, bounce into those. So this is maybe like the quickest method where we can get like a lot of end result out of that, a lot of power from this as a way of creating a plant and get a lot of animation and interaction and collisions kind of for free um, as a relative thing. But the, you end up on the entire giant spectrum of... Yeah, just save over that one. A, a giant spectrum of the where the rig should go because right now these are all just being treated as one giant leaf, each one. But you can imagine the layer where, oh, each one of those should be a separate... Uh, a separate rig and that can bend and do what it wants. And along those lines, like it, it continues down the path of how we rig it. So that could be a series. This could be like one. Let's see. What's the best way of showing this? Um, we'll just make a plane. You can imagine making a rig where there's a joint traveling up a bunch and each of those is connected to that center joint. And each of them will relax. And I mean, that kind of stuff can take a while. I just, just for fun, a couple of weeks ago during one of the bonus streams, uh, I'm still not sure what we're going to end up doing with it, but um, where was it? Maybe here. Yeah, hopefully this opens up smoothly. Um, I, I went and I spent a lot of time rigging a tree, like actually properly rigging a tree. I got to delete some of this dynamic stuff otherwise it's not going to work or it'll choke so let's see if that works yeah so this is a this is a tree that i rigged with uh a bunch of joints this there's a a big complex joint system running through this entire tree and i built all of that and now you can see how every single limb can bend and react and uh, here's a tree turbulence i can crank this up so the wind is uh, maybe that's not the one actually there's a lot of them I'm not sure which turbulent. I haven't played this in a little bit. Yeah, this one's probably the one. Oh, yeah, the wind's really weak. So I can crank this up and you can see the different winds can affect the different parts of the tree, different amounts. Here's the wind for the trunk. So, yeah, this is going to be the one that gives you some of the heaviest power. But then there's the um, there's even the crazier level where you could dynamically rig or you could build this and like the ragdoll system, build these to be like ragdoll chains. And those could then drive joints or be directly controlling the rig on top of that um it's it's a kind of a giant giant open-ended question that's completely dependent on how you would uh how it's going to get applied to your system i mean even in my you know right now another thought jumps in my head which would be each of those like that could be one model we could do the stem and then each of those becomes a single hair so then we get the hairs that way um on the different levels so it's pretty fun and there's a lot of layering we could do um yeah pretty neat though uh was the launch scrubbed from do the winds well then we don't have to worry about it too much i'm not paying too much attention but there um that's a shame i mean it, it just means they'll move it to a different day um Oh, that's too bad. But it, the weather was already looking kind of fuzzy on that. So, yeah, too bad. But now we can answer more questions. <sighs> okay, back to questions. I, that's as far as I'm going to go on this one for now, unless we get something a little bit more specific. Uh, yeah, it's moving to Saturday. Oh, okay. I mean, it's got stuck for uh, Doug Hurley. And um, I think it's Doug and, and Bob are the two people who are going to be flying it. Like, they had to go and get all prepped up and tense. And it's like, oh, no, we're not doing it. Um, let's see, put a volume. Okay. No new questions on YouTube, but we got lots again on Twitch. Hmm. I'm looking for a name. I don't click on too usually because we got a lot of regulars who do it. Uh, yeah. Bob Binkin and Doug Hurley. Yeah. I keep up quite a bit with the space stuff. It's pretty fun. Um, uh, Sid Hesh, Sid, Sid Hesh, maybe? Uh, this art with C4D. Oh, color me intrigued. Uh, hang on, there's an advertisement playing. Hopefully that's muted. Skip the ad. 
Oh my goodness. I don't think I'm going to pull on the proper screen here. I don't think, I don't think this is up our alley. This is um, some crazy level paper folding and it's like fractaling almost. That's crazy. Wow. I mean, first of all, uh, oh man, it's a crazy name too. Uh, Ekaterina? Ekaterina? It's Ka Katerina? Katerina. Katerina. Lukasheva. Luka. Lukasheva. Uh, but in any case, uh, man, that's really cool. But you can see them spending all the time doing all these teeny little folds so it doesn't want to fold on all these curves. It's beautiful. Oh man. I mean, well, first of all, it's just, I mean, I, I, we couldn't do it for real. Like where it's like paper folding. We can't, we can't do very basic paper folding on the best of days, uh, which is super duper tough. <sighs> but could we do it with displacement? What happens if you what happens if we do a displacement with multiple splines on one? I'm just not sure how they would interact. So here's our thoughts. Let me do a bunch of subdivisions on a plane. What's the quickest way to do this? Uh probably with a helix will be super quick. I want to use a most spline, but most splines introduce additional layers of complexity. A height of zero. So if we did something like this, clone it a few times. Put it into a radial that is flat on the ground. Radius is zero. Not quite so much curve. So you can end up with something like that. Nice. If we feed this as a source of displacement, how do the lines eventually meet? That's my question. Boom. 100 displacement. It's going to push it up. Let's go 55. Fall off. Does it see that directly? Yeah, spline object. Nice. So, well, first of all, we're going to get these kind of neat spirals, but that's because it's set to a long. More specifically, curve is what I want. My question is, when these meet each other, yeah, so they're just going to meet and I guess maybe blend. So you, you could potentially end up with this type of thing and... Once again, we can control the fall offs and the curves here. So, the, you know, these could calm down as they get near the edges. So, the basic idea being if, if, you've, if you layer up a lot of really fun displacements, then I feel like you might be able to animate animate the power of the splines or change the rotations and the angles. So you can see I can, you know, I could spin this more. So you can see how these will layer up and make some interesting combinations. That's kind of like where my head goes, where it's like, okay, you can kind of do a fun fake of it. Um, <sighs> yeah, the countdown's definitely gone. I have been, I, ah! That was my alarm for the launch, but not relevant anymore. Um, yeah, so that's all really cool. But like ultimately, I think I'd probably approach, if I was supposed to make something like that, I'd probably approach it somewhat like this, where we can control it via splines and fall offs and how they're interacting with the surface and the radius and along. And that would be my general approach to it. There, there might be more, but that's my thoughts and building it for real like i yeah, essentially building it in the way that it would work in real life um i i i don't see any path forward on that i don't even think you could do that in real life so that's super crazy <sighs> super crazy Uh, Emiliano is asking the ferrofluids that we did, would it be possible to do it on a moving object? 
Um, depends on what you mean by moving. Um, I mean, the, the proper tutorial is coming out next week on Tuesday. The way we did it in, during the live stream was we did it with dynamics. So those were just falling on the surface, in which case, yeah, those could just be moving and doing whatever. They could just do be doing whatever. Um... The new technique is based on the input mesh, which maybe works, maybe doesn't. Um, I don't know. It depends what you mean by moving object. Yeah, that's an interesting one. <laughs> call, call, uh, yeah, I call you Sid. Appreciated. It gets hard to remember everybody's alternate name. Um, because first of all, I'm terrible with names. What's up on the ceiling? I don't know what you're talking about. What's on the ceiling? I did forget to turn on the back camera though. Yeah, Sphere Factory, what are you talking about? But I, yeah, I forgot to turn on this background light. Um, hmm. Are you saying spiders? So I thought maybe there's a spider behind me. Uh, so people talking about the folding technique. Um, do, 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 do. Michael, Ooh, art directable cloth wave. Uh, let's see what that is. Let's see what we've got. Uh, Nomad, Nomad Studio, BCN. Let's see what we've got here. Ooh, there's audio. Art directable cloth. Well, this is looks like it's hand drawn. So, I mean, you don't get more art directable than hand drawn. Yeah, there's like the pencil work. So if you hand draw, then it is what it is. Um, uh, a lot of it just goes to you, you've got a, it goes to, are we, would you be wanting to build a rig? Do you want to build a rig that is just rigged or well, do you, do you build a mesh and just rig the mesh with say joints and then whatever happens will deform it via joints. You have very direct control over the way it is, although it's still not a trivial amount of control. Um, you still have to do a lot of work for how it moves. The way these were sort of spiraling around the back is really, really neat. So, but it's kind of like, okay, do you manually rig something? And that becomes one method of pursuing. And the other is, do you try and wrangle dynamics to do it? And at that point, it's like, okay, well, it's going to kind of do what it does. And we throw the proper forces at it to make it work, which makes it a little bit more like real life. If you want like really nice looking clay, if you're building a shot and there's clothes blowing on a clothes, a clothesline and you want to look a particular way, well, you got to throw the right amount of wind at it and catch that at the right angle. <laughs> yes, my, my, lic my uh, license does expire in four days, but it should be fixed before that happens. Um, so where am I at with controlling? I'm trying to think. I mean, the specifics of the rig really matter. What we were just seeing in that, you know, we could make a hemisphere and take a look at some geometry like this. Like, okay, let's just say that's our base geometry and this is what we want to be deforming or throwing wind at and having control over it. Um, but if you want that really nice kind of lip traveling along it, um, yeah, I'm not... I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of it goes to... Don't underestimate how far you can go with the deformer. Let me see if this works here. I'm not sure if it will. Uh, something I've been enjoying doing is using a Spherify and... If we give this pretty much full strength 
and I'm going to shrink the radius way down, let's say 50. Or if I pull this over somewhere, you can see everything's going to deform. It's going to go super nuts. But the spherified deformer is so much more powerful when you combine it with a fall off, specifically a spherical fall off. So now you can see we have a spherical that is attempting to deform things into a spherical shape, but then it has a fall off of what's actually getting applied. So a lot of the rest of our mesh is getting to remain. So the way we control these fall offs is going to be super important and how big the overall shape is. So we can shrink this down. So now you can see that I've actually got this little, uh, you know, this kind of like automatic spherical wrinkle maker. So with what we were just seeing, you can imagine, um, let's see, generically, the overall shape would be I've tilted back a little bit and we can make a second displacement. Uh, we can use a displacer. I'll put that first. And that should be displacing via a noise. And that should only be pushing up on the vertex, actually the plane of Y. And the noise needs to be really big, like that. And I'll just give it a generic random wind speed of one. Let's say two. Well, one's closer. So something like that. And we could we could you know have this displace more. We could also give it a fall off, so it's only affecting the bottom. So you can see I can very manually build a. We could very manually build a rig here that we have very, very direct control over. And let's invert this. So yes, you see how this is starting to wrinkle down there randomly. It's just kind of blowing a little bit in the wind. But then if you specifically wanted that little ripple on the edge, I could grab my sphere, spherify and I can move this around and get that little extra inflation happening. I mean, you gotta be really careful on the place where it's at. And, um, and with this particular rig, I think what you'd want to do is maybe make a, um, a spline, match the rotation, scale that until we're matching our edge. And then our spherify will travel along the spline and the spline shall be the circle. So I don't know if that's gonna deform or not. I don't really care. The main point being is I can move, I can travel this around. It's a little down, I'm going to yeah, pull this in. So now the displacement is happening. The displacement could happen after actually, that might give us a little more control. So now you can see if we were inclined, we could have this travel around and create that little bulge of a wrinkle. And as all of that is happening, you know, we could make multiple ones and then create a smoothing deformer and this I want to calculate after everything else. So give that as much, as little or as much smoothing as we want to, take off the hard edges on a lot of that. And as all of these things layer up, probably even put that into a subdivision surface. Ooh, six is a bad idea. Yeah, now we can drag this around and let the deformation. I can't drag that and see it animating at the same time. So let's just throw a keyframe on. She'll start around here. Position, play, end. It'll have traveled to about there. Record. But keep in mind how many different things we can layer on top of that, where that wrinkle is just kind of existing full power there as it travels from one side to the other. But if we go to remapping, here's our overall strength. So it could start out at zero. And as we hit play, right around here, it can be at full power. And then right as we get near the end, it can fade back out again. So by layering up a few little things, we can we have now created that wrinkle however we want that to be, exactly how we want it to be. So it's worth not not necessarily working about all of you know the simulation if you can build a rig and just get exactly the type of control that you want. Yeah, like given given that animation we were just seeing, I think this actually would work pretty well. Uh, I think you know we can push it a little bit further. We didn't model all of it, but the layering up of these, deforming out in a particular direction, I think there's a, a lot of potential there. But everything else gets really specific, and I'm not, I'm not trying to recreate that precisely. <sighs> Uh, 
Uh, we got lots of people hanging out today. It's really cool, everybody. Thanks for making it. Um, as they probably are defueling the rocket over there and going to get the astronauts out. Um, it's too bad. They had almost a million people watching live. But the wind, what are you going to do? The spherical fall off on Spherify Deformer. Yeah, we're getting crazy there. So, yeah, thanks everybody for coming and hanging out. Uh, more questions. Uh, and hey, anybody who's on YouTube who wants to get a question in and like put in a big capital question and type it out because uh, YouTube's middle quiet today, but Twitch is going crazy. Um, Java, what do you got here? Instagram link. Let's see. I don't see any audio. Oh, that's neat. It's semi-similar to something we were just looking at. Let's see. I want to save the scene file before I move on. Um, yeah, look at this thing. Uh, so this is from Ari Winkle, I think. When, when, when Cole, Winkle? I'm not sure. Ari Winkle is what I'm going with. Blue Raspberry. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, especially the way these are kind of morphing in the middle. I'm definitely thinking volumes. Um, Semi-similar to a little bit of what we were doing a little, you know, just a little bit ago. Actually, I'm a little fuzzy on getting noise working in volume. So this is worth checking out for a moment. Um, would be kind of a fun rig. Because we have a lot of options. Oh, no, we couldn't spin that. Unless you could. I don't think you could, though. Yeah, the spinning has to come from an external source. So, um, let's see. Uh, I'm thinking we use an end spline, lay it flat on the ground, give ourselves a few segments. You can keep it relatively low poly because everything will get smoothed out via the volume. But I want to displace this in two different directions. Uh, let's see if the random deformer works. I've been using the random also, I mean, you, you, you guys probably noticed, everybody's maybe noticed that I've been using more effectors as deformers lately because it gives you more direct control. So if I were to use a random this time instead of a plane, then this can actually give us plus and minus, but in every axis where normally we need two displacers. But if I say no deformation on Y, we should be able to hit play on this. Actually, not until we set this to a noise. We hit play on this, and you can see I'm actually deforming on Z and on X at the same time in the positive and negative, which is not something we get for free in other circumstances. So, oh, that's the animation speed. We got the scale. Go bigger on that. More deformation. Let's pull this up more. Yeah, we get that deforming more or less. Let's try 333, 333. Yeah, so we can start getting all these crazy deformations. That's actually working pretty well. Um, them overlapping each other could be trouble, but maybe not. Slowing it down just a little bit. Currently, the space is based on global. So if we were to throw this into a cloner, will they all be individual? Seemingly, yes. See, they're all doing their own thing. Um, linear to clone upward. Make as many of them as we want. There, we're getting more of a cross section of the noise, which is pretty neat. Um, there's definitely kind of a spinning vibe to it. If we did want to emulate that, although I don't want to make, you know, I'm not trying to make exactly what they did. I just want to play with some noise. Um, but I like this motion. If we were inclined, um, what's the best way to do this? Actually, making a connect. And I'm making a connect just so we can take our end side and scoot it off in space a little bit. And now, if we were to feed in some sort of, well, let's use a random. So this random is pushing everything off in space. But if we use the random to spin them, then they should be spinning on their axis. I'm going to say 720, so double a 360. Control them via a noise. And the animation speed needs to be real low. 
and they're currently pivoting too far from the center point. So let's turn this off and you can see how I'm really far off center. So if I take the end side and move it a lot more near the center. So we kind of end up with a visual offset, but not too much. Um, global. Okay, let's scale this up a lot. Okay, if we start scaling up a more, then there's going to be better uniformity between them. It just needs a bigger cloud of noise to see. And I'm kind of liking this kind of, it's just random. You know, we're doing a bunch of weird randomness on it. So that's, that's working well enough for me. Um, it's 50 distance between there. Keep everything pretty low poly is just going to save us time. Creating an extrude here. Um, we can say hierarchy and that should automatically see all of them as an alternative. You can say not hierarchy and put this entire cloner into a connect and that should also work. I don't, I'm not sure which one would be faster, but I always think it, doing an extrude of one spline is quicker than doing a bunch of extrudes of a bunch of different splines. Currently it's extruding by 100 units. It's current and we have the new S22 version where it automatically detected the proper axis. Um, they're currently 50 apart. We can give it a thick thickness of 30. Um, some of these are not We're getting some twitches. Now that might not be the, Ooh, that's a big old twitch. I was gonna say, maybe it doesn't matter too much, but that's a bad one. Mm, maybe, maybe, a, them all getting combined this way could be a trouble. I don't think the weld would be a variable, but it, maybe it would be a better idea to put this in here and let's see if turning on hierarchy. Yeah, that does give us a cleaner setup where each of these being treated as a separate extrude. You can tell by making this editable and you can see we get a bunch of extrudes. So that might calculate slower, but the overall rig is pretty clean. So I don't think that's going to hurt us too much. And that should stop yeah, the extrude from getting infused of a whole bunch of different objects with different point counts. And now you just see all the nice layers that we're ending up with. Now you got to keep in mind that these are all passing through a big cloud of noise. So as that thing spins, that has a very large effect on the shape that we're feeding it. And this is, you know, there's a million ways we could, could have possibly gotten to this shape. So this was just an arbitrary kind of fun way of layering something up a bit. Okay, next is our volume builder and volume mesher. We want to do some volume building. That's automatically going to work pretty well. The default voxel distance is 10. Mm, it's not hiding the original, actually it is hiding the original mesh, but I don't know if there's enough space between here to have these be separated. Let's find out. Yeah, actually there is enough space. So then that's actually working surprisingly well. Um, so we already are giving these a little bit of a head start as far as being random, but the main magic here is going to be in feeding this some sort of volume, which don't we have to, I haven't done this in a while. That's why I kind of wanted to tackle this. Uh, we can feed it a random into the builder directly. I thought, oh, uh, not a random effect or a random field. Yeah. Random field. A random field is like a, in a lot of ways, it's like a shader field, but you can generate the noises directly and it makes them calculate quicker. Drag in our random field. And what this should do is it's automatically gonna give us a bounding box, but we can say view it as the objects below. And if that works correctly, it should be, yeah, it's seeing all of the shape that we had prior to it and it's creating this big giant noise and blending them together a little bit. If I were to create, okay, so that's that's fine. We got a random field. It's defaulting the noise. We can change a bunch of these variables. It's all you know relatively small in the beginning. If we crank it up, we should start seeing the noise a lot better. That already automatically looks pretty cool. And let's give it a very heavy, well, maybe horizontal, but I was thinking let's try giving a vertical thing so everything feels a little bit more vertical. It kind of feel like, <laughs> it looks like a big sci-fi stack of pancakes with lots of syrup right now, which, uh, you know, fair enough. Um, yeah, look at that. I don't know. It's not what I was going for, but it's kind of neat. Uh, the volume, the way we fed in the volumes, it seems to be seeing the space in between them in a way that's interesting and kind of useful. Like I, I, I dig it. That's an interesting look. Now, when it comes to the actual thing that we were looking at, a lot of this could go into taking this and saying, actually, I want to see where these intersect and you're going to get more of our pancakes back again. You get end up with this type of shape. I kind of like that syrup look, so I kind of don't want to lose it, but let's go a little bit down this path. Actually, that's what we'll do. We'll just save it. Oops, undo. 
So we got our pancakes with syrup. And now let's say where they intersect and now we get these individual ones. And we see a lot of uniformity between the different layers as they go down. But as an alternative, we could put, you know, put that back down to zero. So there's not much uniformity between them. Scale this way up, um, like five times the size. And now you see there's bigger noises. And actually, if we make the height smaller now, like drop it down to 50, then we can keep pushing away from having too much uniformity between individual pieces. And we can end up with this type of more... A uh, more random shape. Meanwhile, the well, essentially this the y variable. The taller we make it, the more uniformity we'll see between them. And I feel like the reference we saw had a lot of uniformity. Um, now, how quickly does this play back for us? Yeah, it's going to be not quick, but definitely we can definitely hit play. So yeah, this will be able to travel through and create those shapes very nicely. Um, there's a lot of you know, like right here, I think, you know, it's kind of like, okay, this is reasonably close to what we were seeing reference wise. I'm not going to worry about doing the texturing work on it. Um, because, you know, at that point, then we have to go into choosing which renderer it is and everybody has different renderers that they like to use. So overall, I try and keep it a little agnostic. Um, and then of course we've got this final geometry. If we were so inclined, we can create a smooth that can smooth the mesh afterwards. So that makes that nice and smooth. We can also make some nice displacement that happens after or before the smoothing to break up that surface and have it do whatever we want that to do. You know, make it really spiky, make the noise really large, and we can make that feel a little bit more, you know, like uh like water on it or some sort of surface or honeycombs and then keep in mind all different types of noises some are more i don't want to say useful but you know if we use a displaced veronoi if it has enough subdivisions which i would actually not displaced veronoi a regular veronoi this one can give us a very crystalline looking look or if you invert it you get some nice spikes so let's set that to negative 14. you can end up with some nice spikes now our poly count is actually not that high and so we can drop that down as we increase this. You know, we're going to see, we're going to get these very, very cellular looking shapes. Actually, it's, it's pushing a little far, so they're, in, they're counter intersecting each other. But I forgot, actually, this that type of displacement looks like cells. So what's the one I'm actually thinking of? Oh, just for one way three. Of course, this is our crystalline one. So you get these nice little pits in there, which can kind of create cell-like shapes. And if that's inverted, then you can end up with something that kind of looks like crystals or dunes. Hmm. Interesting. Um, or, and now they look like waffles. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, just, you know, you get end up with a bunch of really neat looks, just playing with that, tinkering with it. We subdivided this more, so it's going to play back really slow, but very slowly. But you can see how those layer up and they can become... I mean, it, it's one of those infinite playgrounds where it's just barely a starting point. Now, I mean, I will say for my own personal preferences, I like when things have, uh, I mean, something can just look cool, but you want to build with an intent. Otherwise, you just end up with floating render blobs. Um, okay, so there was one sort of additional thing I was thinking that might be nice here. And that is, what if we, I just want to see if we can make a nice noise that intersects another noise. So along those lines, um, or we'll simplify a lot. We don't need any of that. And then the volume builder, we have our original noise. If I set that the box, we're just going to get a giant box of noise, which is great. That's what I want. Let's say it's 1,000 by 500 by 500. And by 1,000, I mean 2,000. So now you see we get this big square box of a bunch of noise. Now we could change the shape. Uh, or feed it, you know, feed it anything we want, a cylinder or something. But now you see we just get this big blob of noise represented. So I like, you know, that's fine. Now, if I make a second noise and feed in a second, uh, volume builder. Volume builder. Can we just drag these in? It's always nice when you just make them children. Yep. Um, so now we get two identical noises and it's seeing it as a union. The second one though, we can say, hey, do whatever's below. So it's just going to adopt that shape. 
and this noise just for fun instead of it being very vertically oriented i'm thinking what if we make it very horizontally oriented so set this to a thousand by a thousand so it gets really stretched out and tell these two i want to see where they intersect and if oh they're hollow i didn't expect it to be hollow does that make sense maybe Yeah, sign, uh, well, I mean, maybe this may be learning more. It's objects below, but if I say box, now we have to manually type in that same dimensions. Yeah, hang on, I'm running into something that I'm not familiar with. I just want to see if I understand it. Will this, yeah, this is now volumes again. So if we're seeing as below, it's only seeing that mesh, which is interesting. It might calculate quicker or it might not. But yeah, so this one is not a good idea to necessarily see objects below. But um going back to it if we shrink our noise back down if we start what my thought is yeah so what we can do is start getting these really horizontal slices and if i keep on increasing our noise our scale on x and y you see how i can get these random horizontal slices so yeah just fun ways you could maybe stylistically modify the shape and end up with something kind of weird and cool um if you make these numbers really big, it should become like pretty much infinitely flat. Right now, it's not quite infinitely flat, but, but close to it. And the different noise types will definitely create different cuts. We don't see the little preview here, but uh, like Luca, that's going to be madness. This one's a super detailed one, so I expect it to be you know, really thin slices. But different Vro noise could create potentially very interesting different cuts, and it just depends on where it's going to catch. But yeah, just a fun way of slicing, interslicing all of those in perhaps some novel ways, layering noise and visualizing it. The amount of effort I used to do to try and visualize this kind of thing, and it's like, oh, new tool, it just automatically does it. It's like, oh, that's nice, but I mean, yeah, it's just objectively good that we have that. What is, yeah, okay, and you can put smoothing on top of that, and when it comes to this type of thing, we're not so worried about obliterating geometry, so we could do a Gaussian and do multiple iterations of it and just really smooth that out. Yeah, and just end up with our fun blobs. Jump this up to... Oh, okay. Well, we can't go too far or we're going to lose our geometry. We need the detail. But it's going to be dangerous to hit play here. It's taking a, a little bit to calculate. Yeah. Smoothing to layer on top of it. And we can just layer and layer and layer more and more noises. And yeah, it'll be fun. So just throw that out there as an additional thing to play with. <laughs> Let's see. Panda, what do you got? Question for beginners. You're saying it's a simple question, but this is a compositing question. How do you put a background of my video and stick to a door that opens? Oh, actually, okay. We can do something. I, I, I follow Panda. Um, it's a fine question. It's not something we do terribly often. Let me think of... What's a good source for this question? Um, I mean, we need the right photo to work from to do it. So let's do another Google image search for, I'm gonna search for warehouse. And we'll say images. I also want to do tools, usage rights, reuse with modification. Uh, I want a warehouse, like an external one, maybe something from ground level. I'm just, I, I'm not super particular about this. I just need something approximately correct. Yeah, something that doesn't, I mean, hmm. If I find the right image, it's just, just going to save us a lot of effort. That one. So this one's pretty flat overall, and there's not a lot blocking it a little bit. Copy image. Um, it's cropped off on the top a little bit, but I'm going to save the image into this episode. Scene files, texture. Warehouse. 
Um, okay, so it's kind of a projection mapping question. Now, I am... Oh, man. I, I don't want to go and spend a lot of time like properly linking a camera up. So I'm going to do the sloppiest job you've ever seen. The sloppiest job you've ever seen of doing just eyeballed camera matching. I know that we have some tools that do it and you, you can line up the different edges. They're really great. I don't have it in my head to totally do it. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. So this is not necessarily proper workflow, but it will get us to the quest, the core of the question. So there is, can we put on a background? Nice. So there's on the background. I'm going to also put it onto the cube. On the cube, it's set to frontal because I copied it from the background. So uh, like I said, I'm going to do the worst camera matching ever. And pretty much I'm just going to uh, zoom up and place my building in such a way that it kind of feels like we're matching. There's a little bit of a turn on it. And let's see, I'm gonna make the, this editable. Uh, let's grab the top, pull it up. So let's try and just get this to match perspective. What do we need more or less, less zoom up more, pull out backward, rotate up. Like I said, we're not using the proper tools, but that's not horrible. So I'm going to uh, make a camera right there because I now want to spin around this, grab that edge. Now this is going to look worse as I pull it further back because we're not perfectly matching perspective. You see, that's not quite there. And we'll do the same over here. Pull that back. UB, MF. I'm going to do a quick cut right there. Do a loop selection. E for move. Scoot that up just a little bit. Another polygon selection. I just want to grab that edge. D for extrude and pull that out until that's approximately matching. We can try. Actually, I don't want to lose that camera, so I'll make a duplicate. We can try rotating just a little bit more to match it. We'd have to use, oh man, I, honestly, the tools that would do this properly might not take that long. I just haven't used them in a while. And I don't want to, I don't want we already were kind of clunking our way around a couple dead ends earlier, and I don't want to be doing that any more than I have to. So, okay, this is not, no, I want a little bit of ground perspective. Whack, and whoop. That is what we want, just less of it. Back, in, back, in. And like I said, there's a little bit of a tilt to it. Something like that. Yeah, so that's as far as I'm going to go, worrying about that. So let's just say this is our building. We're going to want to do some camera projection on here. Um, I do. I think that, we, I mean, you're saying that the frontal didn't work, but it should, assuming that, you know, this is our building and assuming that we matched it properly, which we didn't. I should be able to just click on this material tag, right click and say generate UVW coordinates. And now it's going to change to UVW. I guess it does distort it. Yeah, it's actually there's some significant distortion on the generated UVWs. Uh, Grunder, I said like four times already that I'm just not, I haven't used a camera calibrate in a while. And if I'm not remembering it well enough, I could spend 20, 30 minutes doing it wrong and not remembering. And it's just not a good use of our time. To, it's not gonna help answer the question. Um, now, well, one thing we could do is if it's if the generate UVs is not working super well, we could leave this on camera mapping and reference the current camera. Oh, whoa, oh, 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 oh. The, um, a lot of this is going to be affected by our resolution here. We need the, oh, dang it, I just wiggled the screen so I minimized all my windows. Uh, just get the chats back up again. Um, 
Yeah, okay, so what, what Panda's saying, specifically the problem is that what we're running into right now, which is where these are distorting and not matching properly. So this is this is what we want to address. Why is that so distorted? So I, well, I'm not sure, but one thing I'm gonna hit and do a few times, get back to frontal. One thought is we need to go and look at what our resolution of our original image was. It's more of the ratio. Where's my scene explorer? Back over to our 20 scene files. Um, this is going to give us the info. Properties. Details. 800 by 533. So let's try that. 800 by 533. So what this should be doing is we're saying our scene file is... You got to set that first because it now has changed my camera perspective a bunch. But now that should be closer to the reality of what we're seeing here. And now I don't know if it'll be any better, but let's try changing that into generating UVW. Now it's still quite a bit of distortion now, but if we do set this to camera projection, I do think that that well, it still stretches a little bit. Standard four, three custom. I mean, I just want it to be the same as, hmm. I want it to be the same as our other one. What is, um, I guess we must put in the same aspect ratio. So that would be 800 divided by 533, which is 1.5. There we go. So once I put in the that ratio, then that seemed to suddenly match. Now we are matching it and that becomes the perspective of that particular camera. So now you can see as I rotate around that it's remembering it from that camera and it's stuck from that particular perspective. So it has a lot to do with ratios, but I do wonder why, can we can now, can we convert that to UVW? No, it goes back to distortion, but is that distortion reality? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody, but I'm going to mostly ignore the chat. Everybody's shouting out tons of suggestions. And I, I when it comes to those kind of suggestions, I just don't know who knows what they're talking about. A lot of people do. And some people are just like saying like, well, this might work. Um, this goes to, this would be something better if I had a little bit of time prepping it and treating it more like a proper tutorial. It's not a technique that I'm using often. So um yeah, I just can't be certain of that. Now, I mean, it would be really great to transfer this as a UV from the perspective. And I have to say that um, I would have... What is the... Generate UV coordinates. I would think that just clicking that would work, but it it doesn't. I mean, you could do a flat projection, but that's not the same. That's based heavily on the... Somebody's saying that more subdivisions might work. I'll give that a try just because it's a easy shot in the dark. So we'll just select everything and subdivide it uh, three times. So you get that. And I just want to see if it's less distorted. It is less distorted. Uh, interesting. I don't, though my understanding of UVs and the math that's involved in them, it doesn't seem like that should really be much of a variable. I wonder if we could transfer the UVs to a simpler object. Or actually, here's a, here's a weird experiment. So that seemed to pseudo work. I'm going to undo and let's subdivide a lot more. So U, Shift, S, let's subdivide six times. It's going to be very heavily, no, that's not as much as I thought. I'll do it again. So super subdivided. So if that is creating more accuracy, can we convert this frontal to UVW and we should see if that does work, which it seems to, we've got virtually no distortion. So, okay, that, that worked, but, um, can we then like melt away all of this excess geometry and will it remember it for instance? Um, cause a lot of work in, I think in our 21 and 22 went into maintaining UVs better. So something like the polygon reduction, will that maintain our UVs. I mean, yeah, it seems to be doing a pretty good job maintaining UVs. And you can see now that those UVs are maintained. It's definitely 
doing a decent job there. And if we keep on reducing more and more all the way up to, you know, the minimum, you can see that we're down to pretty low and it's maintaining those UVs decently well. But even having said that, I mean, I didn't do a good job of, I didn't select all of the edges before we subdivided. But uh, my thought is if we were to, if we did select all of our original edges, which I didn't, but if I were to grab that and that and a bunch of these loops, I'm not going to grab too many of them. But if we were to do that and I melt them away, MN, yeah, MN will melt. And you see that the UVs are actually staying there pretty well. The real question goes into um, will the distortion come back again if we were to clean this up again and not use all this excess geometry? MN, it seems to be remembering it pretty well. So maybe it does need to be, it's interesting, but it needs to be more heavily subdivided and then after the fact we could melt away the geometry um definitely not an expert in that but it's an interesting it's an interesting detail i'll just do a couple horizontal ones and make sure that that doesn't do it and if we had done this properly we could have melted these away very easily but oh wait actually as we do these horizontal ones you see the distortion came back again i wonder at what point that happens. If we melt too many of them away at the same time, does it not like it? Do we need to do like every other one? Because you see now I'm melting these. I, I see some distortion. Oh no, it's yet almost the just as bad a distortion is coming back as we melt more of them. Ah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, Lignazio that we could have just turned this into an end gun. Um, so we'll, you know, say untriangulate and say, actually, oh, there's a new that untriangulate changed a lot, but yeah, we say create end gun and then that should be able to melt in there almost anything. But look, it, it uh distorted again, so yeah, um, I don't know, I'm kind of stumped too. It does, it does seem subdividing more. And just so everybody's clear, the reason I didn't worry about the camera calibration is we were able to get to that what the question was quickly without needing to worry about perfectly calibrating. But I should re-familiarize myself with the camera calibration. I just don't work from images like that very often. I always make everything from scratch. Um, yeah, but yeah, some sort of subdivision, something there. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I should experiment more. Um, Rick, Rick, Rick from Maxon seems to be saying that the distortion is appearing in the viewport because there aren't enough polygons to pin the texture. So it, if that's the case, actually, that is something we should do. If we were to melt these end guns, it's a question of, does it render properly? That's the real question because maybe it doesn't look right in the viewport, but if we render, well, no, it's definitely still distorted there. Um, but if we change this back to a frontal projection, wait, um, I think I have to undo like a million times here. It's not going to, I don't think I'll be able to undo enough times. Nope. I ran out of undoes. I'll just melt it again. And if we did another frontal projection and then once again, convert that to UVW, it looks really distorted, but if we render yeah, if we render, it's still distorted. So it is still really like that. So it needs more to pin, apparently. Yeah, interesting. Not uh, not something I'm, I've really run into. That's kind of interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, apologies, um, Panda, that I don't have a better answer for you. But it seems... But at least I see the same problem you're running into. And I'll have to give that some more thought. But I don't have a better answer right now. Hmm. Blizz, what do you got? Um. Go. How how would you go about making this falling? This watch falling in the liquid. That seems, that just sounds tricky right out of the gate. Oh, well, actually, the, because of, well, let's see if that, well, I mean, 
we gotta see how stylized or how f far the splash gets because how simple these sort of look we might actually be able to do something with them yeah yeah um, that doesn't push so far that we might not be able to, we might be able to do something with it. Um, now I did install the model packs that Maxon sends. We got a couple extra models to work from, so we can go into the content browser. And if you have S22, then you should have all the same models. Now let's see, what should we work from? Ah, uh, vegetables. Mm, eh, not as interesting. I didn't see anything as funny as I was hoping for. Tools. Yeah, tool sounds pretty good. Yeah, nice. Something with some detail, but not too complex. So I'm going to drag in this hammer. Um, It's probably real world scale. That's fine. We'll just shrink everything else. Um, I kind of like everything being bigger so I could, you know, the cube is huge. And that just works better in general for the internal scale I have in my head. But... Let's see what the geometry on this hammer is. It's not bad, and yet yeah, luckily it's using a subdivision surface, so we could turn that off so we don't have to see all of it. Um, so nice, we've got a hammer that we can reference. What's this wedge? Oh, interesting. It's just a little detail on top, I don't need that. All right, so with this hammer, if we rotate it to some arbitrary angle, and put it into its own null, so we're at zero, 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 and we can keyframe this. I'm gonna keyframe it from there. Coordinate Y, and to the end, blurp. Now we'll go a little more down, blurp. All right, so that's kind of our idea. We're throwing in an arbitrary object, and we want to simulate the basics of Splash, but it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't look like a liquid sim. So, can we just do this with displacement? That's the first question. And it's entirely possible we might be able to. So, displacement... Um, actually, it's uh, once again, it, if we use volumes, or I'm sorry, uh, vectors as deformers, they calculate slightly faster. And we don't have to create a color, and they don't invert. We just have more direct control over them. So, it saves several clicks to do it this way. So we want this to push down. I'm going to say minus five. That actually seems significant because we're at such a tiny scale. Everything's going to be more, more powerful than I'm expecting. Now, um, I don't know if we need to... I'm going to put it into a connect because why not? Put it in a connect. Don't weld, though. Inside of the plane. Well, let's just feed in this geometry directly. Let's brute force this sucker. So this is seeing the individual points of the object. Now, the points actually calculate a lot quicker than the surface. So let's see if we can stay stick with that. And let's see. So here's a radius, and it's a pretty tiny radius, but you can still see that seeing a lot of the geometry here. But let's just play and see what we end up with. So you can see how it's traveling. Now it's a little chunky because there's not as much geometry traveling horizontally. Now we can turn on surface, and I'm hoping uh, as soon as I turn on surface, you see how much slower it's calculating. Let me look at the actual difference here. So this is running at 62 frames per second. If we turn on surface, it's dropping down to 14. So a significant drop, but you see it does see the mesh better. So something to keep in mind there. We should be able to shrink the radius more and restrict effect inside and outside. Yeah, that all seems fine. So you see actually this is doing a reasonable job right away for kind of just pushing it down. Of course, it's happening a little bit before the hammer gets there. So a, a generic, a quick, silly way of maybe making this work is let's create a copy of the hammer and it's currently seeing the connect object. If we hide the connect and scoot that up, then we can make it so that the whole, uh, the model is actually hitting a little bit later and then it can sink down. Now, um, we currently have it set to surface, and now that means it's only seeing the surface, and we get this middle part popping up. So now we have to possibly set this to volume, and volume might be even slower, or it might not quite calculate accurately enough for what I want. Yeah, now it's very specifically seeing the internal, although it does calculate surprisingly quick. I'm surprised. So an option we have is actually to create a duplicate of that. Let's feed it in twice. 
and one of them will see the surface at one and the other can see the volume and if we add the effect then we should get the the hole in the inside going so now it, you know you know seems reasonable right now um a lot of this is going to have to do with our radius and how we can control the fall off but let's see how far we can push it there's our surface i'm going to increase it to two and currently it's pushing everything down but if we go to not maybe remapping but what i'm thinking is creating a oh this is gonna be interesting i can create a range map we don't use this too often create a range map and this is currently saying that the value is going from zero to 100 but i'm gonna say actually your value is going from minus 100 to positive 100. So a bunch of it's going to go away, but that's because our clamp is on. As soon as I turn off the clamp, I expect everything to jump up a little bit. Yeah, everything jumps up. But now we're feeding it a larger range of values, which means if we now throw in a curve, oh, we can put this back to, oh, is a curve? Oh, the curve seems to clamp. Oh, that's interesting. The curve is, oh yeah, curve before and curve after the clamp. But it seems like the clamp can always see from zero to 100 which is interesting, it doesn't stop us. It just means it has to calculate before the range map, which might be a little less intuitive. Um, but the thought is, is if this goes up to 50%, then it should be kind of back on their, our back onto our original shape. And if we curve it down, yep. Wow, that's actually working quicker and easier than I thought it would. If I curve this downward, we're actually going into a negative value. Keep in mind, this is, if I get rid of our range map, actually it's still working even without the range map, which is just kind of putting us back to those original values. But now you see it does still push down, but now I'm saying that this outer edge should push up first. So if we you know, allow that to do whatever curve we want, we can push this further. This could curve more down. Actually, I guess we want to curve more up, something like that. You can see how we're getting, it's working surprisingly well. Uh, in, in turn on the range map is gonna make everything a little bit more powerful. Maybe it's still pushing everything up in the air a little bit, but Let's just generically, let's just take a look at what that's doing. So we kind of get this, it's a little jittery, but we're getting this kind of splash upward and then it sinks and there's a pit. Um, even though I pushed it down further than I thought I needed to, it wasn't quite enough. So let's go negative 30 or that's fine. So this can transition down. Blurp. Yeah, that's working fine. Uh, yeah, I didn't need to go that far. 20 is fine. All righty. Splash. Now, uh, it's really, it's pretty powerful right now, but I mean, at this point, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of what we want to do is sort of there. We can use some smoothing after the plane and this should uh, chill out how powerful that is. We don't need, um, we, you know, we could change the stiffness here. So we can use just a little bit and really round those out. Uh, increasing the radius is gonna go a really long way here on the plane. We are feeding it those two different models, specifically this surface. If we increase it, we're gonna increase the overall radius. And as that increases, I think we're also increasing sort of our resolution overall. Couple options there. We could increase our resolution here, which is just gonna double the number of points, which doubles all of that, which means we could probably even do more smoothing, but still, you see now it's nice and smooth, but we're still maintaining more of that kind of upward push. Um, but I mean, it's probably a lot slower to calculate, a lot slower to calculate. So just for our own sanity, we'll keep that low. And then of course this is calculating on a low poly mesh, which is fine. Uh, but the smoothing is obliterating a little bit. We can push this further. We grab this curve and say, nope, I want more. You know, get more of an upward curve on that. We got, you know, add additional geometry here too. So you can push that out, you know up more, down more, more of a splash. If this pushes down more, you get more. So, you know, you have complete con control over the way that curve is being calculated. I just don't, I want plenty of that upward part. And the smoothing, and keep in mind the smoothing, I'm, you see actually I was pushing it really far and the smoothing is obliterating it. So keep in mind that when you have those on or off. So you can curve this, you know, to whatever degree that that seems like a good amount of smoothing. That should be fine. Splash, splash, splash. And then uh, layering things up on top of that is what would come next would be things like using uh, delays and decays. I don't know how, I usually just, I never usually have a plan when it comes to delays and decays. It's just like, hey, let's create them and see if it does something nice. So smoothing should kind of slow everything down a little bit. So you can see there's more of a transition into it. You see all those like quick jitters went away. Actually, that smoothing is working really well. 
um, just check it out again. Here's no smoothing. You see it's like jitter, 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 pop, 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 pop. And all that happens really quickly. If we put on a smoothing, which is not one we typically jump to, look at how now it's forcing a smooth transition into those working really well. Uh, I'll create a second delay, turn off the smoothing one. And this one, just for fun, we'll try playing with spring. And spring actually can go a long way to doing similar effects. So now that should get some overlappy splashes. Um, I like the ending there, splash. Uh, let's try layering it on top of our smoothing and see what that does. Better. It's well, it, it didn't look good by itself. Now on top of the smoothing, they combine in a better way. So that's that's pretty cool. I mean, I I, I like that. Um, it may be a little too much spring, maybe not enough, but you know that's doing its thing. It's just seeing the geometry. Yeah, I'm actually decently happy with that. Uh, and then we have. Uh, decay, which is just how long is it going to live? Once again, we should, should kind of look at it in isolation. So this is going to remember it, and it's not going to feed back in quite so quickly. It's going to take a little bit more time. And as we increase it, there'll be more and more. So yeah, you see it takes longer for this trail to catch up. Now, that is another one that's like, oh, how does this combine on top of other things? So the order really matters, but now it's going to remember this. And you see it's really taking, now it feels more, you know, it's more like a tar, or it feels like a non-Newtonian non fluid type of idea. I'm going to move it before. Typically, I put decays to be the first thing. So it's like that happens, and then the smoothing can come after it. It is really damping the impact. Maybe a little bit of it can do something. We're just going to like calm it down and leave the effect going longer. Tell you the truth, I don't think it's adding too much to it. Blurp. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm actually decently pleased with the that overall effect there i feel like we're matching the reference decently well now on top of that actually what's funny is we're talking about a lot of techniques i just put in the new tutorial but or the tutorial for next week we can also play with a jiggle deformer which can kind of come after everything it could technically come before the smoothing but let's just leave it right here let's see what it does by default and this should really up the liquidiness of it yeah you can see more of these splashes so that's what a jiggle does a really good job of is you know adding jiggle on top of everything. Um, because everything's getting jiggled and delayed and whatnot, it might be a good idea. Our hammer is taking a little bit to get there, so may, it might be a good idea to not have it offset quite so much. But we haven't even changed any settings here. We could get rid of a lot of stiffness. We could get rid of the drag, and that's going to just make these move and wiggle even more. Actually, that made it feel more like cloth in a way. But, um, yeah, when you, and structure, a lot of these are going to make it so that the splashes can travel out further. So if you want it to, I mean, that feels, this very much feels like this surface is reacting to it. And when it comes to a lot of liquidy sim, it's not so much about like doing an accurate liquid sim. It just needs to feel like it's reacting to it. Um, I, maybe a little more stiffness. I feel like there's like this weird pinch that's happening at part there. But yeah, look at these like splashes and these ripples will actually, uh, we need some more frames, but you actually see some of those ripples are traveling outward, which is definitely something this, the Driggle gives us. You'll see these splash outward more than what the original one was doing. And that can be really neat. Uh, you gotta go careful on structural, but structural can really like crank up the effect. I think it's going to feel more splashy if we, you know, pull the structural down and let's go crazy on it. Very low structural. We're getting in danger territory here, territory right here, but you never know. And yeah, keep in mind that this is layering on top of everything else. So if we weren't smoothing out so much, then that's going to be feeding in a sharper initial thing. So everything's going to go crazier there. And then we could say the smoothing comes after the jiggle. So there's a lot of layering here that we haven't been super specifically even, you know, trying to swap those around. It's, it's the hammer's getting a left behind a little bit, but you can see that just playing around with these settings, there are a lot of combinations that might give us a lot, of, or kind of exactly what you want it to in um, in some combination. So this is maybe a little more splashy than what we were seeing, but I do like it. But just turning off the jiggle, I think we'll be back to um, more of just this ripple on the edge, which is more stylized and maybe more of what you'd be looking for. So yeah, I think that's actually probably, I'm actually quite pleased with that one. It worked better than I thought it would. Um, I, maybe our hammer is offset a little too much. It's um, getting there late, so I'm gonna pull it up. Yeah, it's gonna match just our overall shape a little, a little tighter now. 
And I'm also impressed at how, I mean, first of all, we're just kind of brute forcing it. It could be a good idea that we should have built this out of like a couple of primitives where it's like it could be a very simple geometry or we could have built it out of like a cylindrical field and a couple shapes and then it'll just be able to calculate really fast. Instead, we're brute forcing it and just saying, look at the model. So it's a method you can do. Um, splash. And I mean, keep in mind how much control we have over this. We're saying it should push down, but we could invert it, tell it to push up. Um, yeah, it's just really neat. Um, yeah, fields, fields, um, fields are, I feel like oh, we're at the point where fields are coming into their own. We're, we're starting to get to those techniques where it's like, oh, we can really control these things how we want. And we have a lot of options and, and ways to do it. Uh, I like the jiggle, but it's a little, a little much. I don't like those initial, I like, I like those splashes we get where it travels outward, but some of it's not quite working for me. Um, excellent. Um, hey, Rick, if you're still listening, would, uh, if I, if I saved the scene file, would, uh, would Maxon not like if, if a simple scene file like this ends up living in the Patreon files or should I like strip everything out of it? Just a, a question I sort of had because if, uh, if you don't care, I don't care, but I will continue respecting it if that's the case. Um, Liquid splash ish. Uh, let's see, we're already a half hour over, but I wouldn't mind checking. Uh, okay, that's cool. Well, I can just leave the scene file for everybody. Um, uh, so uh, on Patreon, you'll be able to dissect this one directly. Uh, let's tackle one more question for sure. Uh, Mick, what do you got for us? While you're here, any chance you can create a raindrop splash that creates a bubble that pops after floating around on the surface for a second or two without any simulations? Well, I'm assuming when you mean without simulations, you mean like not doing particle, more like this, or we're using a rig like fields. Um, honestly, it's even crazy because like, okay, this is all of our geometry, but look, this, this is our rig. It's just this plane. And, you know, I don't know, it's just so clean and simple. Um... Yeah. Okay. Excellent, Rick. Good to hear. Um, a bubble. Mm. I'm trying to think of what I would do with it because a lot of it goes to, okay, you drop in like a penny or a drop of water and it creates a splash. The actual physics of it are not trivial. I'm going to copy and paste this basic rig and let's bring in a tiny sphere. Uh, my point here is, well, let's just layer a couple things and see what happens. Um, we can simplify some of this. I'm going to turn off kind of, well, we've turned off virtually everything. We might turn some things back on again. Creating a spherical field here, because if we're dealing with a drop, then dealing with a spherical field is going to give us a lot of control. Now, here's a thought. If I make this pretty much almost almost exactly the size of the sphere, then we can let this displace. And I suppose if we give this a remapping of full power, so we got full remapping, go into curve and change the curve so that this can ease in and ease out. And this one, especially there, essentially, I want that to look very much like a sphere. I, I like transitioning into be smooth. And now we're displacing a lot. So we don't need to displace quite so much. So under parameter, let's displace less. And essentially, we want to displace just barely more than the sphere. 2.5, perhaps might even that is seemingly a little not quite enough. 2.75. Yeah, so now it's pushing out enough. And now the radius is a super important variable here. So if I were to make that a little bigger, then that's where that starts. This pushes down and uh, we can just play with our curve inside of the fall off and make that look as spherical as possible. Uh, a couple extra dots might help, but something like that. So it's very similar to it. So it's not quite hitting the surface. So, you know, we can move this around. It's not quite there. And when it comes to a lot of bubble type things, I feel like that's a, a, a lot of it would be like that. But a bubble in the water is kind of contained in the surface of the water. So at that point, what does that even mean? Like, like I feel like it actually sort of means we're doing the opposite. It means we should be pushing this upward 
and this becomes a subtraction on it. So if we said, actually, this goes up, and now it's going to perfectly capture the sphere there, and that becomes a hollowing out. So along those lines, and then the surface tension is a big variable. I don't know. It's a easy question to ask, but I think a tough one to actually tackle. Um, let's make a very quick basic water material. <laughs> Beep. So we just got our reflection and refraction, drop that on all of this geometry, which should hopefully have been all combined into a single mesh. There should already sort of be, actually no, the HDR will exist in the viewport, but not in the render. So we need to, we need something to reflect. So I need to add an HDR. Um, I have HDR link. I will not be able to include that, but you just throw any HDR in. Let's see, what's a good one here? I, it doesn't really matter. I just need something with high contrast. So, uh, well, my go-to is derelict one, so I'll do that. Actually, what did I just do? I uh, You need to apply material for that to work. HRI Studio would work as well, but, and that's a plugin from Grayscale Gorilla. If you're not familiar, tools I helped put together back in the day. I want to, oh, wait, what are we doing? We are up. That's this material. That texture should get plot driven by link. Link will now feed that in. Nice. So this material's in there. Everything's been loaded. Uh, and then you know, we don't need link anymore. So it just loaded that material in, which means this should refract. And let's see. Yeah. So now, now you can see that we're getting this bulge and it's a hollow. There's like this empty thing. So you get this unbroken surface. Actually, it looks better than I thought it would. We get this unbroken kind of surface tension traveling up and over. And then the bubble on the inside. So, yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, so, if... I don't know, there's like two different parts to it. But it's like, I think actually that would be the structure of a bubble. Now, it's probably like supposed to be compressed. It's a little, very hard to see. But it's probably supposed to be compressed, like pinched on the top and bottom a lot. You can see actually there's a lot of thickness on the top here where it's pushing up a little too much. It's really... Really sensitive. I wonder if I can get T for scale. Oh, nice. I can't hit T for scale. I'm scaling up and down the plane, and I can just very precisely do that. We're still in a very small scene file, so the my in intuition for the scale of things is going to be off. But yeah, this uh, this hollowness is really adding to a nice effect here. Uh, we're not looking. We haven't looked at any reference. And we you know we should look at reference more often. But I'm still not going to because then it goes to if this was to pop, what I think would happen would be essentially a hole would exist in the top. And then it would the hole would spread until there's just the surface there. So if that is sort of the case, um, what's a good? Well, just um, this is going to be dangerous, but I'm going to throw this to a bool and create a second sphere. And this one I can just scoot out because it's A subtract B. And now you can see that I've essentially opened up the top here. So now this there's not it's not hollow anymore. We see through the surface. So if that is the material, then now we've got a popped bubble there. And effectively, I think if you're popping a bubble, you would want the some point on the top to suddenly open. And then that would animate outward until you're sort of eating away at everything. And then this would, and at the same time, this would be scaling out or scaling or, you know, uh, you know, scaling down or animating up. So if that was simultaneously moving up, that would slowly erase its way out. And now this should be, I mean, this should be closed. It looks like it's just a hole. The bool should be, it's a subtract B. This could be inverted. That's maybe a problem. This might need to be the opposite. Uh, I kind of don't make it edible, but I will. You are. You are. Invert. You are. Hmm. Doesn't seem like it is. You are. I, I don't feel like my normals are inverting. You are. No, they did there. Uh, invert. You are. Huh. I'm not sure about this normal thing, but it's not fixing the bool either way. So I'm going to do a few, few times. Uh, yeah, the, um, the bull seems to be, it seems to work there, but at a certain point, it seems like suddenly it's not leaving the mesh behind and it suddenly it's just like open. So it should be connected small. Maybe this should be connected. Um, 
It could be a good idea. We're throwing a lot of geometry at this, but we could be using volumes. Um, so what's a, I want to keep it as simple as possible. So let's make a, actually we can go back to real world scale or not, you know, big, big giant scale, just so that my defaults are what I'm expecting. So let's keep the same concept, but it's going to be with volumes. So we don't need this to be nearly as tall. So 50 tall, make a volume builder. And then inside of that, we're going to make a sphere, shrink it down. Um, move, I'm going to move the cube down minus 25. Um, uh, model mode, minus 25. So that's right on the surface. And I'm going to add this in. And those are going to be uniform. They're going to be merging into each other. We need our mesher. So now we should end up with this type of shape. And so you, know, you get that bulge coming out. And then we need a second sphere, T for scale, shrink it down a little bit. And this one should be subtracting. So that actually should be creating a little hollow bubble on the inside. Now I'm going to leave everything very, well, we can double our resolution, chop it down to five, um, which means we should be able to make that a little bigger and tighter. Okay, something like that. So this has now become a big old volume with a hole in it, which should render and give a very similar effect. Yeah, I mean, that bubble looks great. I think that's what a bubble really would be. So you get this bubble and it's it's hollow. There's air in there. Now, the next step, if it's, well, first of all, could we animate this into existence? Because if, well, see, this could be the a drop falling in. You see, it's already hollow, but if we do just let it hit, it will just continue into the surface. So if it was a drop of water, I think you'd have to scale this outer one into existence. I mean, we're, this is going, it's going well enough. So let's, let's see what we can make happen. Um, after my timing is going to be way off, but let's say right around now, that's the Y position at the beginning. We'll have them up in the air as if they're a drop. So that will, you know, it should play back fairly well. So that drop is going to go in there. Now the air bubble is what gets captured. So, uh, let's see how weird we have to make this, uh, at this time, let's say that there's a full on air bubble. Actually, it probably comes later, but let's say there is at this time. So the scale of that will record. Now, if we rewind, probably to not very far back. Let's put the scale of that down to zero. So that's suddenly going to be like, oh, now there's suddenly a bubble captured as it pushed down. Now, technically, that'd probably be a pocket of air at the front of the bubble that gets forced down under, but let's just let's just roll with it. And then, I mean, even on top of that, these, if we were making a full-on bubble, then these would be splashing down. And this is where it ends up, let's say, a couple frames later. But in this point we'd actually have that overshoot and go down so now you just have a bubble traveling down so it just travels down and it's going to go up to the surface and then you know let's just say that this is holding position for a few frames like that and then we can do the pop and i'm thinking um what would be the best way we could add another sphere i think adding another sphere is a good idea but maybe it's not strictly necessary so I'll make a copy of this one, kill off its keyframes, kill off the radius. So it just is whatever it is. A subtract B. This one will pull up and now you can see, boom, it's eating a big hole out of there. So this will start out with a radius of zero. Keyframe that. And then um, also we're going to be keyframing this one. So we'll keyframe that. Now keep in mind, this is, uh, that's the shell. That's the air. And this will be the air hole. So this one, over the course of a few frames, let's go all the way to 90. Over the course of some frames, it's going to start increasing. It's going to essentially eat away at everything. And our air, I will keyframe its position. Yeah, it is keyframe right there. And as this bubble starts bursting through, I think that our pocket of air can be escaping, which means it's going to be traveling up and out. So that, at this time, will keyframe up and away. And honestly, this air hole, it's creating that, but it should, uh, it's erasing that out, but as it gets to this end, it also probably should have traveled away. When there's, uh, let me make sure I did that right. Uh, yeah, that should pull away and it's gonna smooth that out. Probably only needs to go about that far. Um, back at this time, I think I need to be centered again. 
Oops, uh, there's keyframe, but I want a keyframe, not everything. Down to there, keyframe Y. Okay, so that is, this is scaling up into existence at the same time that the pocket of air is erasing itself out. And then the last thing is we have this shell, which is kind of this additional bulge on top of everything. That needs to sink away. So that is also keyframed on Y. And as all this is happening, this will actually be animating its way down until that is flat. So you now see that we've transitioned. We transitioned from having a bubble into, I'll have to change the timing on these. I guess I shouldn't have had this big pause. <laughs> I'll grab everything and delete. Uh, maybe I can just drag that onto it. Yeah, so I'll travel up and then go pop, and then it smooths away. Actually, that's working pretty well. Um, uh, the only thing, and actually, as long as we're doing it, we can maybe just scoot our air hole down. So if it's supposed to be kind of implied to be uh, right around here, it is animated there. But if right here we say, actually, this was kind of an air pocket being generated right at the collision point, we can keyframe that. So that will slowly, you see how the bubble starts down below a little bit and then it's going to capture and, I mean, the movement's a little bit weird, but then the bubble comes up and then the top pops and then fades away. Now we could have had a couple holding frames there, but I think that's actually looking all right. Seeing right through the mesh. I mean, it's not really something I ever thought about too much, but I think that's kind of the physics of it. Um... We'll see how long it's taking the render. It's pretty quick. It's going to look a little bit, uh, it's going to be thick right now. It's going to be a little bit janky. Uh, I think we can probably increase our resolution a little bit and some smoothing will go a long way, but we're going to have to use a really light touch um, because it's going to be likely to obliterate our bubble if we're not careful. That seems okay. I mean, but okay, yeah, see that smoothing is super... Like this frame suddenly is going to pop a lot, which maybe isn't wrong, but um, as much as I want to keep the smoothing, let's just not have it on right now. And it will be it'll look a little bit janky on the edges, but it might work. Um, okay, so let's see. No, well, actually, we'll see the bubble come in here. So we don't need the first 20 frames, but the rest of it will just render out. All frames, 20. Don't worry about saving. No, that's not true. Let's save it. I'll just save it to MP4 because we're not going to be compositing. Renders. Um, bubbles. It's not really a splash, but it's a it's a bubble pop. Bubble splash pop thing. I have not saved this file. Wow, I'm living on the edge. All right, uh, let's send it to the picture viewer. Let's see what we get. Do, 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 do. Uh, subdivision surface actually would probably go a long way here. That wouldn't have hurt. <laughs> Solid water. Yeah, I think this all makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, good thing to call out. A couple, let's do a couple, while this is rendering, a couple quick notes about some various things. Um, First of all, if you don't know, I have, I put in the description below is, uh, I transferred recently, I transferred the rocket lasso YouTube. I took everything, the archives, let me start this whole sentence over again. So there's kind of two main things I post on YouTube, full on tutorials and replays of these live streams. I have moved the replays of the live streams into their own unique channel. So that channel is where the live streams are going to be living from now on the replay. So if you want to see those replays, you have to go subscribe to a, a different channel. So uh, if you're on YouTube, you can go down into the description, you're gonna see a link directly over to it. I've also tweeted about it recently. And maybe I can find uh, I can pull up a link here just so I can have it in there. So that is one thing. Actually, it's really, uh, if I change my channel, we could break it. I, I need to grab it as a link from somewhere else. Oh, I need to do it from here. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, no, it's YouTube. Rocket Lasso Live. Dang it. Yeah, I just can't, I can't get the link handy. Sorry. Um, <sighs> 
So anyway, you need to go and subscribe to the channel. That's one of the big points. Uh, another important or another thing that could be handy for you is join the Rocket Lasso Slack. So if you go to Rocket Lasso Slack dot com, you can go and if it loads, did I type it in right? I think I did. Well, let's give that a second yeah you can go here and click this button and join the rocket lasso slack where we got a bunch of these same cool people who are hanging out in the chat answering and asking questions doing cool projects um it's just a good time and everybody who's in there everybody who's in there is helping each other everybody's just being cool everybody that comes in be cool if you're not being cool we will remove you because it's a friendly helpful community for constructive feedback and just trying to figure things out together um Let's see, this is actually going pretty well. I mean, like I said, some smoothing. Actually, that's what I should have done. I should have just put a smoothing deformer on there. That would have gone a really long way. Um, but yeah, come check it out. It is good. The replays definitely follow the new YouTube channel because you know I'm going from tons of subscribers to almost none on that new channel. And the reason for that is I'm now doing, I'm trying to do weekly tutorials. And I wanted to separate those out because a lot of people like seeing big produced things but you don't want to you know you don't want to be a, getting a feed of three hour live streams every week if that's not something you're interested in um so let's see that should be done let's see i mean it's good the timing's gonna look terrible on here because we didn't even check it but we get the bubble wow okay that's like i mean the timing's still terrible but as far as like the reality of a bubble that's not bad like you get the little it doesn't exist and then suddenly you can kind of see it's like oh wait it does exist you get that nice shell giving us this really nice hollow refraction because you see the big difference. That's a sphere of water. That's the drop. It's a sphere of water. And now it's a hollow sphere of water. You can visually see a big difference. One looks like a bubble and the other looks like a ball of water. Very different refractive properties. And then um, it kind of bobbles down and then we pop the top. Or actually, well, I guess we sink down and it's just the, a balloon of air, a hollow spot. Pop back up. And then we put a second sphere, which expands, er erasing that out while everything else moves out of the way. And then eventually we're just left with a final smooth surface. It's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, uh, it might be worth exploring further. I mean, I think a drop of water is something that a lot of people play with. And it's a nice kind of, ta it's a good concept of tackling volumes. So that could make for a fun little tutorial as a standalone. Um, yeah, that's where I, that's why when somebody asked a random question like that, it's like, well, I don't know the physics of it. Let's just, I didn't, like I said, I should have looked at reference. I know a couple of people put links of reference. Um, so that'd be a really good idea, but just thinking through what the logic of it would probably have to be. It's pretty cool. Blurp. Um, yeah, this, this initial bubble probably should travel down. You see how it's very much traveling up. It probably should have been immediately traveling downward because it's like, it's getting pushed down by that initial water. And then once it does, it could push up. But bleep. yeah, I'm actually quite pleased with that. Uh, excellent final question. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for coming and hanging out and asking questions. Obviously I couldn't do the show without people coming in with really interesting questions because I wouldn't think to just try and make a drop of water super close up. But when it comes to CG, that's a, or even just motion graphics, that's a thing that comes up pretty often. I like that hammer drop. This was actually a good, was good in relationship to all of that, even though we built it completely differently. This one we just did entirely volume. The other one we did entirely with a deformer and layered field. So that should be all good. Uh, oh, thank you so much, Zach, for tracking down the link. I'm going to post this on YouTube as well. In YouTube, click that link and go sign up to that new channel where I'll post all the replays. Um, let's see. Well, yeah, that should wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Uh, follow on Patreon if you want to get the scene files and if you like the kind of stuff I do and it's appreciated, but not necessary. As you can see, I'm still doing the live streams and I still do the tutorials for everybody. It's just kind of early access and you get scene files and stuff. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I had a good time and I'll see the people on Patreon tomorrow for the bonus stream. And otherwise, uh, that should wrap it up for this week. See you in next week's tutorial and next week's regular live stream. Thank you so much, everybody, and bye-bye.